Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Oh my God, Rob Core. <laughs> Doomsday Clock. Oh my God, this story is so good. This this issue, this first issue is everything I hoped it would be. It's an incredible start to an incredible story. I can, I can, man, I can guarantee you that. All right, so a little bit of history here. The original Watchmen uh, comic, in a lot of ways, played out like the film. I mean, there were a lot of aspects of the film that were pretty much the same. There were two main differences between the film and really just one main difference between the film and the comics. Uh, the biggest difference was that instead of Ozymandias detonating bombs in these different cities across the world, instead, what he did is he unleashed this giant monster on the city of New York. But the whole idea remains the same. Same. The world, for the most part, was on the brink of chaos, that nuclear war was going to engulf everything. It was like if the Cold War between the United States and Russia never ended. And so because of that, with the original Watchmen taking place in 1985, the idea of Ozymandias was if people cannot unite on their own, then what they need is they need a common enemy, a common goal. They need a singular banner to unite under. And so creating this, this massive catastrophe in the city of New York, this massive event that cost somewhere near the, the lives of 3 million people, ultimately unite united society in a way that people never really thought before. And so what we find out in this story is that where the end of the Watchmen saw this unification of humanity, this sort of, you know, one one pact, one world kind of thing, ultimately by 1992, where the story kicks off, it had all gone to pot. And the reason for that was because in the original Watchmen comic, Rorschach was basically going through and he was notating everything that had happened. That was the basis of Rorschach's journal. It was documenting this whole event that was unfolding. So by the time the story came to an end and you found out that Adrian Veidt, this guy who was formerly a superhero who had turned, you know, philanthropist and businessman, or he was the one that was originally behind it all, this was basically documented in Rorschach's journal. So at the end of the story, when Rorschach's journal was sent to the press, and the press began running this article of the fact that it was all just a giant ruse, that it was what people now refer to as the great lie, that society fell deeper into chaos than it was before, because now they felt like they'd been tricked, and they felt like three million people had been sacrificed, as opposed to, you know, people finding a hope on their own. Now, this is cool. Jeff Johns is not really a writer to focus on like the dark side of humanity. But the cool thing about this is that it almost seems to hit it home as the nature of people. To take kind of a cynical approach here, and I'm not really cynical by nature, but humanity was at a fork in the road. They were given this information that said, hey, look, it was basically a ruse. It was this guy, Adrian Veidt, the world's smartest man who had engineered the deaths of 3 million people to unite all of you under a single banner because you were acting like children and you couldn't do it on your own. And when humanity was given the choice of, well, do we continue this trend? And do we say, yeah, I mean, maybe he was right. Maybe we did need a singular cause and those 3 million people's sacrifice can be honored by creating a better world. Or we can just descend back into chaos again and just totally ruin any sacrifice they made. Humanity chose to descend back into chaos again. And so it's very much a kind of Grant Morrison-esque Alan Moore method of storytelling where it's like where they, they take these kind of concepts and they basically say all the worst things that happen in the world happen because of people. Because people do them. It'd be a lot easier if we could point our finger at a supervillain. But to quote, you know, V for Vendetta, if people are looking for the guilty party, they need only look into a mirror. And that's the whole point of this. That's the whole basis behind this is to say humans are responsible for all the terrible things that happen. And so one thing I, I want you guys to also notice too, is that we're getting this sort of monologue, this almost like a diary entry in terms of how all this is happening, which is interesting because Warshak died at the end of the first Watchmen. And so it's kind of cool because the question becomes, well, who is it that's narrating this? Who is, who is it that's going through and making this whole discussion and talking about these things? Now, the other half of this is that we end up finding out that after the events of, you know, really like this, this revelation from Adrian Veidt, so on and so forth, that political parties in the United States began using it as a means to try to consolidate, you know, power under one another. And that's kind of the cool thing, because in a lot of ways, this almost teeters on the basis behind the, the TV show Jericho. I don't know how many of you guys ever saw Jericho, but Jericho was a great show. It was basically this show that took place from the perspective of the people who lived in a town called Jericho. And there's this nuclear explosion in Colorado Springs, I think it was, where NORAD is based. But people were just kind of freaking out and they were kind of panicking. But what you end up finding out is that that was not the only nuclear detonation. Instead, some crazy faction got a hold of nuclear weapons and detonated nuclear bombs in 26 major U.S. cities, basically bringing America to its knees. And then after that, you had the eastern United States, which is what was left of the federal government, and then everything west of the Mississippi or the Rocky Mountains, I can't remember, which was the allied states of America. And so you effectively had the, the works being laid for a second civil war within the United States, and all of it hindered on the last remaining nuclear bomb, and it was just a great race to try to get it. This is very much the same way. People consolidating power. It's designed to illustrate 
absolute chaos and complete and total pandemonium. Not only that, because of the fact that this is all predicated on the great lie, it means not only is the United States descending into madness, it's also other countries too. All these different news agencies are reporting about how Russia is invading other territories, expanding its empire, different things like that. And that's why it's kind of crazy because we don't know which of these is true. And when I say which of these, well, we'll find out here in a second. But what we end up finding out from this whole, you know, bit of a monologue is that the news network started publishing it, the news network started talking about it, then the government started systematically shutting them down. The government just has a sweeping amount of power, more so than it had before. The president's kind of out of the picture. Nobody really cares about what it is that he's doing or they're trying to figure out what it is that's going on. But Adrian Veidt is the world's most wanted man. The world's on the hunt for Adrian Veidt. And so what we end up doing is we actually end up having a member of the press who's actually inciting rebellion among the people. Rise up against your government. And they're immediately quashed. They're immediately silenced. And the whole idea is that in turn, we basically get the national news network, this giant propaganda piece. And that shows you how how far things have fallen in the span of seven years from the end of the first Watchmen story till this one starts humanity experienced this golden era of peace and then humanity brought this golden era of peace to an end and now we basically have this propaganda machine cranking out information Russia's invaded Poland we have to respond with nuclear weapons and so what we end up doing is that in the middle of all this panic in the middle of all this chaos we basically pick up in a prison where you know a guy's basically trying to orchestrate a prison break by attacking a guard and when he goes to knock this guy out we end up having some pick up the keys and this person is Rorschach. What? <laughs> How did Rorschach live? Where did Rorschach come from? Now, here's the funny thing. So we were at New York Comic Con and we got the ash can for this whole thing. And for those of you guys who don't know, the ash can is basically like, hey, here's just kind of a preview, rough draft kind of a thing on what the story is going to be, you know, on what the story is going to look like. And it was super cool because like myself and Comic Storian, we were sitting in the panel with like Jeff Johns and maybe like five or 600 other people. And Jeff Johns was like, hey, so do you guys want to see like the preview for or like uh, for, for Doomsday Clock. And we were like, yeah, man, like we really want to see that. And so he, uh, so he starts running over, like showing the preview and everything. And he got to this point, dude, the top plum came off that place. You guys should have seen it. It was bananas. People were freaking out over the fact that Rorschach came back. We basically pick up with Rorschach as he makes his way through. And this is very Rorschach-esque in terms of how this thing unfolds. He went to a diner, you know, on, you know, to get some breakfast. And uh, the woman that normally serves this uh, pancake syrup, you know, her boyfriend, took her, you know, out back, and then she came back with bruises and a busted lip. Rorschach found the guy, stabbed a fork through his tongue, broke his hands. I mean, it was it, <laughs> it was amazing. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's awesome to see this, this, this cool monologue unfold. But Rorschach is basically talking about how the U.S. gave Russia a four-hour ultimatum. If Russia does not back off from invading Poland in four hours, then the United States is going to use nuclear weapons. Now, the whole idea, grabbing that idea of, like, the National News Network and the propaganda machine and rolling it over into what Rorschach is basically telling us this is basically nonsense it's this scenario where the the united states government is feeding the american people false information under the auspices of creating a reason for why it is that they want to either attack russia or disable russia or something along those lines now the indication here is that with adrian veidt having this global sharing information for the most part that russia knows all the strategic points of the united states and how to basically cripple the u.s using nuclear weapons and so the goal of the u.s is to create a common threat to say see russia's the bad guy stop protesting us we need to worry about Russia, everybody focus on Russia, and then launch nuclear weapons at Russia. What we end up finding out is that where these nuclear weapons are being prepared to launch, you know, we're just, they're just waiting on the three and a half hour mark to hit, we end up having Rorschach locate someone by the name of Marionette. Now, there is a reason for why these characters are here, and we'll talk about that in a second. But one thing I hope you also notice about how Rorschach talks is that it's very much in broken English. When Rorschach spoke in the Watchmen comics, for the most part, it was kind of broken to a degree, but it was still like traditional English, you know, regular English, the way that we normally speak. It does feed into the idea that if this is Rorschach who's returned from the dead, then things just aren't quite right from him, you know, aren't, aren't quite right with his character. So it's kind of cool in terms of how this unfolds. But with regards to the character of, uh, of Marionette, Rorschach popping up basically says, hey, look, I'm going to hire you for a job. And the payment for this job is the location of where your child is. And this is cool because Marionette freaks out and immediately tries to attack Rorschach. Now from there, her, her idea is, well, then we have to find my husband. We have to find mine. And this is cool because once they locate mine, it's in the middle of this massive prison break where guards are being beaten up and different things like that. And we end up finding out that mime is putting on somewhat of a show in the sense that where a couple of prisoners consider him to be sort of nonsense, the fact that he never talks. You know, when Rorschach and Marionette show up, Marionette makes the case, well, this is just part of mime's 
show. Just wait and watch. And Mime basically responds by just killing all these prisoners. But the reason why I say these are characters that Johns put in here intentionally was because during New York Comic Con, Johns had basically said, these are versions of Punch and Julie. Now, Punch and Julie are old Charlton comic characters, and they made their appearance back in Captain Adam number 85 in 1967. Now, of course, we talked about Charlton comics before, one of a myriad of comic book publishers, really from like the 1940s going into the 1960s. The problem was by the time the 1970s and 80s came around, Charlton just wasn't able to stay afloat anymore. And so DC had basically purchased up a lot of the characters that they had and then rolled those characters into DC itself, which is where we got Blue Beetle, different things like that. But Punch and Julie were basically just these nonsensical characters. They were characters where they basically found some alien technology. They ran a uh, puppet show called Punch and Judy. And the whole thing was that when they became criminals, they started calling themselves Punch and Julie. And that was really it. Most recently in DC Rebirth, they were part of I Am Bane, where Batman broke into uh, Santa Prisca, where he was forming a suicide squad of his own of sorts in order to in invade Bane's prison. That was really the basis behind that, you know, for the purpose of taking Psycho Pirate, bringing him back to Gotham in order to cure Gotham Girl. Again, I have that in the Batman playlist that you guys are welcome to check out. That's the actual Punch and Julie over there. These characters, Mime and Marionette, are based on those characters. Grabbing a vehicle and taking off, what they end up doing is, of course, Rorschach keeps making allusions to his, to his partner. You know, now the indication here is because of the direction they go in, their partner is actually Night Owl. And that's cool here because they go to like, you know, the, the owl ship and they're in the base of the old Night Owl. They have the Night Owl suit and everything there. But what we end up finding out is his partner is not Night Owl. His partner is Ozymandias. And I was just like, what? No way! And it was, it's crazy because Ozymandias has been hiding underground this entire time. He's been just underground and he basically grabbed Rorschach. What we also find out is this is not the Rorschach that we know. It's not the Rorschach that we're familiar with. Somebody took over his name. Somebody took the title of Rorschach after the original Rorschach died. Who that person is, we don't know. But the cool thing about this is that Ozymandias really kind of hits on the mistake that he made. What he says is, I do not have the means to fix the world. We don't even know if the world can be fixed. But if the world can be fixed, if it can be restored back to the place that it's supposed to be, there's only one person who can do it. And that person is Dr. Manhattan. We have to find Dr. Manhattan. At this point, we cut away from the whole Watchmen, from, from everything with the Watchmen, and we pick up with Superman. What this does is it seems to pick up with like a flashback or a dream of sorts. And he's actually talking to Martha Kent, talking to Jonathan Kent about a, you know, a prom that he's going to, that kind of a thing. But notice the way this is done, this is throwbacks to Superman's secret origin. For those of you guys who don't know, Jeff Johns wrote a few secret origin stories. And for the most part, secret origins are just a line of publications that DC has. They're basically just more condensed down versions of the origins as they appear. And they usually put like, two or three in any one particular publication. But the whole idea was that with Jeff John's Secret Origin of Superman, it was like a six or seven issue story that detailed this brand new origin for the character of Superman. And that's what's been used really as part of DC Rebirth in a lot of ways. Now, Superman Reborn changed a lot of that stuff, but it also brought a lot of those things back too. So it kind of rolled in this perfect origin for the new 52 slash classic Superman melded into a singular character. But with regards to this version of Superman, we're kind of left to assume that, you know, it's it's the, the one that we see now in DC Rebirth, but it's not. And we'll find out why here in a second. But the cool thing is that he's basically reflecting on this whole, you know, this dance, you know, this dance party of sorts that he's going to. And the funny thing is that back in, the, in his younger years, Superman really kind of had the hots for Lana Lang. She was the first person to learn that he had powers, basically. And she was the one that helped to train him to use his powers, to, to figure out how he could fly, to figure out how to control his vision, different things like that. And so she was very much an intricate part of him becoming a superhero, as much as John and Martha Kent were in teaching him his moral compass. But it's kind of cool because back in these younger days where he had feelings for Lana in a lot of ways, Pete Ross, one of the other friends that Clark Kent had, was the first one to ask out Lana Lang. <laughs> The problem with this is that as John and Martha Kent are driving home, they basically end up in a car wreck and that's where they die. And Superman snaps out of it. Now, the reason why I say this is not the Superman that we're familiar with is because Superman's parents, as far as I'm aware, never died in a car crash. Jonathan and Martha Kent have died, but like usually Jonathan died of a heart attack and Martha Kent wasn't long after that. Their passing has been done in different ways, but it's still kind of a big moment because this seems to hit at the idea. This is not the Superman we're familiar with. This is a totally isolated Superman. If the events of, you know, Doomsday Clock are taking place on 
a Earth somewhere, then that means it's got to be taking place on an Earth in a different universe. And if it's taking place in a different universe, and the Watchmen are rolled into the DC universe, or DC multiverse now, then it stands to reason that universe may very well have its own version of Superman. But the question has to be asked, if that version of Earth has its own Superman, where's he been all this time? And that's a crazy thing, is because again, as far as I'm aware, Superman's parents never died in a car crash. Now, this may be a change, and there may be some part of his origin that I'm, I'm missing over here, and if there is, I'm sure a lot of you guys will, will correct me down in the comments comments, but it's huge. This is big because what this does is, it, you know, it basically hits at this idea. Superman has never had a nightmare before. He's never experienced a bad dream in his life. You know, him having this nightmare means one of two things. It means either it's organic or someone's messing with Superman, but it's kind of crazy because the question becomes what happens next? Okay, so we are picking up with Doomsday Clock Part 2, and really, in order to keep from, like, spoiling the events of The Watchmen, because I know that while the story is, like, 50 years old, or 40 years old, or something crazy like that, a lot of people never read it. I mean, they saw the movie, but they never actually read the comic. So in order to keep from spoiling the end of the comic, we're not going to go too deep into what the aftermath of the comic is, or at least what happens at the end of the comic. What we will say is that with regards to where Doomsday Clock picked up, it basically picked up with the end of the world, the fact that everything had come crumbling down. And so really, this deals with like these, these last vestiges, these last moments. But for reasons that were never really explained to us, Ozymandias had gone as far as to basically recruit the characters of Marionette and Mime. Now remember, Marionette and Mime were in a lot of ways the, not really Joker characters, but characters that were kind of like homages to Jokers. Now in truth, the way there's the way they're kind of being depicted here, it's almost like they're more of a Joker-Harley Quinn relationship in the sense that I would say Joker would be more like Marionette and Harley Quinn might be more like Mime. But we didn't really know why Ozymandias wanted them so much. We don't know why he brought them in. Well, what we end up doing is get this kind of tape. Of course, Ozymandias basically gives them back the things they normally need, their, their outfits, perfume for, for Marionette, different things like that. But we end up, you know, having this tape that's shown to Rorschach. And what this tape reveals is that somewhere along the line, over the course of the careers of Marionette and Mime, they had gone to rob a bank. Now, of course, this bank robbery really kind of played out the way we would expect it to in the sense that things went nuts pretty fast. But along the way, they're basically greeted by the arrival of Dr. Manhattan. Now, the crazy thing about this is that Dr. Manhattan would have just incinerated them in their entirety. And that was the expectation, you know, from like the bank manager, from the bank tellers, the customers who were in there, they expected Dr. Manhattan to just obliterate Marionette and Mime in their entirety. The problem is that Manhattan chose not to. And the reason why was because he basically realized that Marionette was pregnant. Now, of course, we talked about this in the first video. And in fact, that's one of the biggest things that's hit on in the first video is that Marionette and Mime had a child and they wanted to know where it was. I mean, there's a, there's a point in the first story where she's like, where's my baby at? So of course we know that you know that they that they have a child together, but it is cool because one of the things that's really kind of focused on when it comes to Manhattan is this sort of lack of concern about humanity, this lack of interest. But one of the things that really kind of also focuses on in the original Watchmen is that if Dr. Manhattan is being human, he's really being human in name only, in the sense that, well, this is what humans would do, so that's what I will do. Like it's these little you know, these little tidbits of humanity that are still somewhat part of his person and kind of leak out here and there, so to speak. But the funny thing about this is that Adrian Veidt didn't know that. Ozymandias did not know that Marionette was pregnant. You know, Ozymandias looks at that and says, well, Manhattan chose not to kill him because there's some kind of connection they share or something along those lines. It's desperation. Where Ozymandias is the smartest man in the world, what he's doing is grasping at straws. The world is coming to an end and we have to find Dr. Manhattan in order to save it. He's the only one that can do it. And I'll believe anything I need to believe in order to find him. In times of desperation, people will believe whatever they want to believe, whatever will make them more comfortable. Even if that belief system defies all forms of logic, if it defies all forms of evidence, they will move those facts aside and they will replace those facts with their own opinions because it makes them feel better about the reality of the situation. That's the nature of things. Now, the other thing about this is that Ozymandias also came to the realization that Dr. Manhattan glowing blue is just a byproduct of electrons escaping his body, but what it does is it leaves a trail. And so the argument of Ozymandias is they can literally follow it like breadcrumbs and they can find out where it is that Manhattan went to. Because with Ozymandias' explorations and his, you know, investigations, he's found nothing to indicate that Dr. Manhattan has moved to some other place in the universe. In the mind of Ozymandias, he's gone to a different universe, presumably the main DC universe. And so the result is that as these bombs begin crashing down around everyone, we ultimately end up having the Watchmen, Ozymandias and Rorschach alongside Mime and Marionette, basically teleport to the DC universe. And it's actually kind of cool because what it does from here is it picks up with 
Bruce Wayne. Now, one thing I want you guys to remember is that Doomsday Clock is believed to basically take place after everything that's going on so far. So Doomsday Clock takes place after all the current stories that are going on in DC Rebirth right now, after the events of Dark Knight's Metal, all is really kind of like after all that stuff. It takes place in the future. How far out, we don't know. We don't know if like Dark Knight's Metal will end and then immediately jumps into Doomsday Clock or if there's a span of like a month or two and then Doomsday Clock starts. We just know it takes place in the future. And the reason why we know that is because for the most part, the attitude of society has shifted. Where society, you know, previously embraced superheroes, society has basically turned against superheroes. They've turned against Batman. They've turned against Superman. We don't want you guys here. Now, again, we could really attribute this to the aftermath of Dark Knight's Metal, for example. Barbados leading all of his forces into the world, you know, and attacking all the superheroes, all the citizens in Metropolis being converted into Doomsday. Gotham City has really kind of come crashing down during the Gotham Resistance tie-in for Dark Knight's Metal. All those things that are going on, we can really kind of presume that that's when that takes place. But that's all we can do is make that presumption. We don't know with an absolute certainty that that's the case. The other half of this is that Bruce Wayne has basically had to undergo these sort of annual psychological tests, more or less, to satisfy the board of directors. And the reason for this is because of the fact that the board of directors effectively believes that Bruce Wayne is not capable of leading his own company. Now, the reason why this matters is because LexCorp is currently in the process of trying to buy Wayne Enterprises, meaning Lex Luthor would run everything Wayne Enterprises is in charge of. Now, the immediate concern of Lucius Fox, as well as Bruce Wayne, is if this happens, then basically the Batman project will be exposed or it'll have to go underground. But we won't have the resources we have now. Basically, you'll lose all your financial backing, all your gadgets, all your little tricks, all those things. Those will all go out of the way. In truth, it would actually see Batman just kind of return to his to his golden age form back in like the 1930s and 40s when everything was pretty simple and pretty basic. I mean, he still had things like the Batwing, stuff like that. But what it basically means is that Batman would no longer be the sort of fighting force that he would be at the moment. The Bat family would presumably go away. And so Gotham would just kind of be left to whatever criminals really just kind of take it over and run it in its entirety. Bruce's only real concern here is, well, we just need to worry about Batman. We'll worry about that first. We'll, we'll try to figure out a way to keep that, to keep that solvent. But as long as I pass these psychological tests, it doesn't really matter. Picking back up with, you know, Ozymandias, Rorschach, Mime, and Marionette, of course, they crash land in Gotham City. And it's cool, because as they make their way into the city itself, they travel to the public library, they start to notice a lot of similarities, as well as a lot of differences. Now, remember, from the world of The Watchmen, the way that story was written by Alan Moore, it was designed, in a lot of ways, to be the real world. The Watchmen was designed to be like, what would it be like if heroes existed right now? You wouldn't have Superman flying around, you wouldn't have Green Lanterns, you wouldn't have Wonder Woman or anything like that. The most extreme thing you would have would be a guy like Dr. Manhattan, who gained his powers from an intrinsic field in terms of like superheroes per se, you'd have things like the Minutemen, some group that rose to prominence in 1939. You'd have people who would just be running around as vigilantes, throwing on, you know, makeshift masks and different costumes and so on, and just kind of using whatever training or whatever martial arts they've learned to try to keep the streets safe. And so when you're Ozymandias and you're looking around and you start doing research on the city of Gotham that you're in, as well as the world that you're in, suddenly you start learning about things like Superman. You start learning about things like Wonder Woman. You start learning about things like Green Lantern. You also begin to notice these characters were fictional in your universe. And that's what Ozymandias points out here. In their world, Superman is a fictitious character. He's a comic book superhero. Wonder Woman is a comic book superhero. Green Lantern is a comic book superhero. They've gone from one universe where those characters would pretend to stepping into a universe where they're real. It's very Grant Morrison in terms of how it's done. And it's actually really, really intriguing. But doing some more research and doing some more poking around, in the mind of Adrian Veidt, they can't just go to anyone, right? They can't just go to Wonder Woman or Superman or whoever. What they need are the smartest people. And that's for two different reasons. The first is because those smartest people would be governed by logic and reason. The second is because of the fact that those individuals would be able to help them with whatever resources they need, you know, using their intellect and so on and so forth to help them achieve the goal of tracking down and locating Dr. Manhattan. And so the idea is to split up. Ozymandias himself will go after Lex Luthor and Rorschach will go after Batman. So again, it's cool because what this does is it kind of bounces back and forth between the two. You basically end up having Rorschach who shows up at Wayne Manor, manages to kind of break his way in. And then as he's going through looking for clues and so on, discovers the clock that leads down into the Batcave. And Rorschach descends down into the Batcave and triggers a trap set by Bruce Wayne to alert anybody if anyone enters the cave. From there, it switches over to Ozymandias. Now, this encounter between Ozymandias and Lex Luthor is amazing. It, it, it is so cool. And it's, it's one of the most interesting things out there because remember, with Lex Luthor, he's very arrogant in terms of how he functions and who he is. But remember, assuming this follows the events of Dark Knight's Metal and everything that goes on, and assuming all things 
being equal, Lex Luthor's not a bad guy here. Lex Luthor's not a villain. Lex Luthor is a guy who's still a hero, but he's still Lex Luthor. He still considers himself to be the smartest man in the world. He's still very arrogant. He's still full of hubris. He still staunchly believes he's right in everything he does. But notice this, and this is kind of the cool thing. The way that Jeff Johns writes Lex Luthor and the way that Lex Luthor interacts with Ozymandias, you never know he was a good guy. And the reason for that is because you're not supposed to know. If Lex Luthor's written right in DC Comics, you wouldn't know that he was a good guy until he put on a Superman uniform and went to go save the day. And that's why it works. You know, to kind of sidetrack for a second, that's why you can shift back and forth with Lex Luthor. You can have him be a villain when New 52 picks up. You can have him become a good guy during the story of Forever Evil. And then you can have him, you know, stay a good guy after Forever Evil. And the personality remains intact. The arrogance, the hubris, it all stays as a cohesive part of what makes him who he is. Because that's what people like. That's what people like about Lex Luthor. <laughs> They like him being arrogant. They like him being like, yeah, I'm the smartest man in the world. Like, why wouldn't I be? And it's really kind of funny because him and Ozymandias play off of each other. Ozymandias' is an initial answer to the question from Lex Luthor, you know, with regards to who are you is, I'm the smartest man on my world. You're the smartest man on yours. And Lex Luthor is like, okay, well, then you're obviously a bonehead. And it's hilarious because what ends up happening is Ozymandias explains everything that happens with regards to the original Watchmen story. And Lex Luthor's response is, and you really thought humanity would stay together? Like, you thought that would be the thing that would bring humanity together? You know, you thought that, you know, having some common force and, you know, massive loss of life would be the thing that would unite humanity? Like, if you're the smartest person in the world, I would hate to meet the dumbest person in the world. Now, again, this works beautifully. It works so well because it's this whole idea that Lex Luthor is just like, I mean, that's not how I would have done it. And if it's not how I would have done it, then it was the wrong thing to do. But it's funny the way this exchange is done because it's almost like Jeff Johns basically saying, Ozymandias is so far out of his element. Lex Luthor is so far beyond Ozymandias in terms of who it is that's smarter that it's almost comedic. Speaking of comedic, <laughs> speaking of funny, while the two of them are basically talking to each other, of course, you got Rorschach investigating the Batcave, while the two of them are talking to one another, a shot gets fired in the office of Lex Luthor, only for us to find out that gunshot, that bullet, came from the comedian. How he's there, I have no idea. I have no idea how the comedian's back. I have no idea where he came from. I don't even know who he is. And it's just like, no way, no way, dude. I saw that and I was like, Jeff Johns, man, Jeff Johns. Not only that, you end up having Rorschach in the Batcave and he's met by Batman. And Batman's statement is, you ate my breakfast. And Rorschach's statement is, yes, I did. Batman and Rorschach meet each other for the very first time. So Jeff John strikes again, and holy hell, dude, Doomsday Clock number three is so good. It is, uh, <laughs> man, it is, it is incredible. It's, it's, it's an amazing story. Uh, for those of you guys who are just now joining us, you know, if you, if you're just kind of, you know, hopping on this whole bandwagon of Doomsday Clock, Doomsday Clock takes the Watchmen from Alan Moore and rolls them over into the DC universe. And the last video ended on like a pretty massive cliffhanger, which was the return of the comedian, because as we've seen in our Watchmen video so far, the comedian died at the beginning of the story. That's kind of what set the whole Watchmen story in motion was the death of the comedian. And so the idea is like, you know, when, when he showed up at the end, it was, okay, who's playing the comedian? Like, who in the world is playing the role of the comedian? Somebody's got to be playing his character because, I mean, the comedian's dead and, and he can't be resurrected from the dead, right? Well, the cool thing about this is that it initially opens up with, like, the comedian uh, seemingly just kind of, like, appearing in the water in the DC universe, you know, out in the ocean somewhere. Of course, you know, swimming to the surface and, and basically coming to, and he's met by Dr. Manhattan. Now, this is huge. This is massive. On the surface, it doesn't seem that huge, but this is huge because he's wearing the exact same outfit, you know, the bathrobe and everything that he was wearing when he originally died. The indication here is that Dr. Manhattan intervened or resurrected the comedian. Now, I would say Dr. Manhattan probably intervened. If he resurrected the comedian, then like Eddie Blake would have just shown up like on a street somewhere or in a building somewhere. But what it looks like is at the time he was being thrown out of the building, uh, when he was basically being attacked in the beginning of Watchmen and before he hit the ground, he was effectively teleported away. And we've seen that happen, right? I mean, that was the whole basis of the Oz effect. Mr. Oz is the, the father of Superman. He was supposed to die when Krypton exploded, but instead Dr. Manhattan stepped 
trapped in and whisked him away, teleported him away from Krypton and threw him on Earth, and then basically forced him to, you know, perce uh, perceive Earth and to see Earth from everything that was going on in the eyes of, you know, just a normal person and, and so on and so forth. But the reason why this is such a big deal is because it's been established in the Watchmen, at least in the original Watchmen, uh, Watchmen comics, Dr. Manhattan cannot time travel. He can't travel back and forth through time. He can perceive time all, you know, all happening at once. And so because of that, it's really intriguing because either this means he has a new set of powers or time is passing differently in the Watchmen universe than it is in the main DC universe. But again, it's, it's one of those weird mysteries that goes on. We don't know exactly how all these pieces fit together. It is really intriguing and it is really interesting. Now, the other half of this is we're not really given a time frame of when this is that comedian landed here. We don't know if this happened 20 years ago. We don't know if this happened five years ago, if it happened, you know, an hour and a half ago. We don't know exactly when this took place. All we know is somewhere along the line, when Comedian was falling to his death, he was whisked away by Manhattan. He ended up in the DC universe. And at this point, we pick up with his attempt to take out Ozymandias. Now, of course, this leads to a uh, leads to him really, you know, trying to kill Ozymandias because of everything that happened in the whole Watchmen comic. Of course, kind of picking up with the idea of Doomsday Clock and so on and so forth. And the other half of this is that Lex Luthor was kind of caught in the crossfire, right? Like the killing shot meant for Ozymandias was, you know, ended up hitting Lex Luthor instead. But the fight that breaks out is pretty intense and it's very reminiscent of, of what we would expect in this kind of a situation. Comedian versus Dr. Manhattan. I'm sorry, yeah. Comedian versus, um, versus you know, Ozymandias. And it is pretty intriguing because remember, Ozymandias is supposedly one of the fastest people alive, if not the fastest man alive in Watchmen because he was able to like catch bullets and so on and so forth. The reaction time was unbelievable. But again, it's kind of crazy because, you know, Eddie Blake starts talking about things like how death changes a man. But again, it's 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 kind of a mystery here. We don't know how all this stuff fits together. Now, of course, you know, Ozymandias is able to make his escape. Lex Luthor's kind of left behind. Uh, Ox you know, Ozymandias is injured in the fall. And then at that point, we pick up with Rorschach and Batman. And that was really like the biggest cliffhanger of issue number two was Rorschach meeting Batman for the first time. But remember, this is not Walter, or this is not, uh, you know, Walter Corvax. I don't know why I keep saying Corvax, but it's been hinted right off the bat, or it's, at least we've been told right off the bat, this is not the original Rorschach. But the two of them meeting each other is really intriguing. And so it's really kind of Jeff Johns hitting home at this idea of saying, hey, look, this person is not the original Rorschach, but he does have possession of Rorschach's journal. And this is cool because he basically passes this information to Batman, passes the journal to him and says, you need to read this. You need to read this journal and everything entailed within it. Now, at this point, we pick up with Marionette and Mime. Now, remember, Marionette and Mime are like the old Charlton comic characters. Again, for those of you guys who are relatively new, uh, while Marvel and DC do stand as like the biggest and most popular comic book publishers right now with like Valiant and Image at a really, really close second, what you also had back in like way back in the day, uh, really before Marvel became Marvel, back when it was like Atlas and maybe even Timely, uh, is you had Charlton publications. And Charlton created a lot of characters, Blue Beetle, different things like that. And a lot of those characters are just kind of rolled over into DC when DC bought Charlton just because of the fact that Charlton couldn't keep up with DC in terms of sales. But Marionette and Mime are these, are, you know, kind of a tribute to these old Charlton characters. They're designed to kind of be a homage to these old superheroes from back in the day. But for the most part, when they, when they popped up, people immediately got the vibe of like the Joker and Harley Quinn. And it's designed to be that way. And the reason why is because when they've been thrust into the uh, DC universe, they show up in Gotham City. And it's really intriguing here because once they get into Gotham, well, then the question becomes, you know, what is this place? Let's explore this city and let's see what's going on. They basically make their way to a, uh, to a bar of sorts, which is the Joker's bar. And this is cool because the Joker, you know, one thing to keep in mind when it comes to, to DC comics, the Joker has these different little places here and there, you know, these different places he operates out of a way to kind of build his revenue, different things like that to kind of make sure that the stream of money flows to a degree or at least to always access henchmen. And it is interesting because Marionette and Mime don't know who the Joker is, but it is funny because a fight inevitably breaks out here when they kind of show up and they're like, look, we don't know who the Joker is and we don't really care. Uh, we end up having Mime basically pull an invisible gun. Now, this is all new to me. I mean, this this is new for the most part. I mean, this stuff is, is really like uncharted water where previously it was believed that Mime was wielding like invisible weapons or at least miming weapons. What he actually has are invisible weapons. He's got an invisible gun. He's got invisible daggers. And he actually shoots a person with this invisible gun. It's really cool. 
and it's really, really intriguing because it kind of throws people off. You have a guy who walks in here and it looks like he's got a gun in his hand, but in reality, you don't see anything. But then suddenly the trigger gets pulled, there's a flash of light, and somebody's brains are all over the other side of the room. So it's really, really interesting. Now, of course, these two, one of the things that, uh, that, that Jeff Johns hit home is the idea that they're very sadistic. They're designed to be reminiscent of what we would expect with the Joker and Harley Quinn. And so they tear all these guys apart. I mean, they, they literally crush every single one of these guys. And with everybody having been taken out, everybody having been, you know, more or less killed off, the question they have is, who's this Joker guy? And let's go find out who he is. Let's go see what's going on with this Joker fella. It's really intriguing and it's super interesting. Now from here, we basically pick up with, uh, well, really with a lot of ways, Johnny Thunder. And this is kind of a big deal. Now, Johnny Thunder is a character that we've talked about before, and he really kind of had his big moment, only really a couple of appearance, uh, appearances so far. I want to say one was in the button, and the other one was in DC Universe Rebirth number one. But Johnny Thunder is a throwback to like one of DC's oldest characters. He really is. I mean, he goes all the way back to Flash Comics number one in 1940. So he's been around for a long, long time. Now, in truth, the reason why Johnny Thunder is so significant here, or at least the reason why I think they're invoking his character, is because Johnny Thunder is a character that, that's in possession of what amounts to basically a genie. I want to say it's pronounced as is. It's like it's like YZ or something like that, but it's basically called the Thunderbolt. When Johnny Thunder accesses this power, he basically becomes a reality warper. Like it's insane how powerful he is. He can do virtually anything he wants to. Now this is all pre-crisis stuff. I mean, this is all stuff back from like, you know, uh, All-Star Comics number 42 and like 1948. And this is all old school stuff before Crisis on Infinite Earths. Now DC could grab it and they could roll it over, but Johnny Thunder, as we see him here, being an old man, all indications is that the post-crisis landscape for Johnny Thunder is still intact, meaning uh, he doesn't really have the Thunderbolt power anymore, uh, he doesn't really have the power of the genie anymore, but it doesn't mean that he can't. It doesn't mean that it's not possible for that to happen. We've seen him, you know, have it originally, then we saw him lose it, Jakeem picked it up, uh, who was basically a post-crisis character that was designed to kind of reinvigorate and re reinvent the character of Johnny Thunder, or at least the concept of the Thunderbolt. Um, eventually Johnny Thunder just kind of, you know, basically died. And then of course he came back to her in Blackest Night. But the fact remains that, I mean, it's entirely possible that even if he's not necessarily the one that would be in possession of the is genie, the Thunderbolt power, it doesn't mean he can't get into contact to, uh, you know, with those who can, but it is intriguing because again, we're talking about a guy who has reality warping power, or at least with the is genie would have reality warping power. Now, all that brings into sharp relief, the question, if the, that, that power is that strong, then like what? What hope would it would they have even against Doc Manhattan anyway? Because the power of the genie was basically equal to the power of Mr. Mixopidelic. But we saw in Superman Reborn that Mr. Mixopidelic was terrified of Dr. Manhattan. I mean, that was one of the things that was fleshed out that Mr. you know, Mixopidelic had at some point in time come into contact with Manhattan and realized that even with all his reality warping power, Mixopidelic was basically dwarfed by the power that Dr. Manhattan had. So again, it really kind of begs the question, what hope do they have? But if they do have a reality warper on their side, then conceivably they stand a better chance than just kind of Superman fighting against Dr. Manhattan and hoping for the best. Now, this also brings into sharp relief the nature of the JSA, right? The Justice Society of America. You know, that was really kind of like DC's way of answering the question, why is it that Jay Garrick, the original Flash, doesn't exist anymore? And DC said, well, I mean, you know, uh, all the superhero stories where you see Barry Allen running around as a Flash, that all takes place on Earth-1. All the superhero stories where you see Jay Garrick as the Flash, that's all on on Earth 2, and it was pretty simple, for a time anyway, until really about 10 years later when it just turned into absolute madness, but it's well established that for the most part, Jeff Johns loves the Silver Age of comics, and rightfully so, because back then it was really more of like lighthearted superhero fare as opposed to now when the stories are a little more gritty and a little more reflective of the nature of the world that we live in. And so with the return of the JSA, it would almost seem like this kind of missing link in DC Comics would sort of be rounded out. It would be like if Marvel brought the Fantastic Four back. There's something about the DC universe that's just not right. It's just kind of missing that one thing that really kind of sets it all off. Uh, you know, Shazam is another character who's missing, Martian Manhunter. There's a handful of things that are out there that would help to kind of complete the DC universe in the eyes of fans. But in terms of the impact of the Justice Society, it's bringing an era of of comics where hope is really the name of the game. That was the base, that was the way it was with the JSA. And when you look at things where it's like, well, because of the Superman theory and because of the fact that 
you know, 97% of all the superheroes originate on Earth and because you have all these different, you know, programs out there, the Russian government that's using, uh, you know, their kind of metahuman testing to basically weed out people and arrest them that they believe to be metahumans. It's almost like this idea that Johns is kind of going back to his, you know, to the kind of uh, infinite crisis roots where this is a criticism of superhero stories as they exist now. I wouldn't say this is as heavy handed as Infinite Crisis, but I will say that it's kind of hitting at the idea that either the DC universe is kind of going down the same path as the Watchmen in the sense that the Earth is kind of on a collision course for self-destruction, or it's a criticism of the idea that the world kind of seems hopeless at the moment in the DC universe, that things are pretty dark. And what the DC universe needs is a spark of light. They need something to kind of say, hey, look guys, it's not as bad as you think it is. And having Old Man Flash, Jay Garrick, you know, having Old Man Green Lantern, Alan Scott, having these characters just kind of show up and basically be this kind of beacon where they, they sort of set the landscape and they're kind of these other superheroes that embody the hopeful concepts of Superman would really kind of beef that up a bit. That kind of seems to be what Jeff Johns is hitting at here. Now, again, that's speculation on my, on my behalf. It's not really anything guaranteed. It's not a solidified thing. It's just kind of how I look at it and interpret it because, you know, as a person who is really, uh, relatively new to DC, I will say that from what I've seen with people commenting, it feels like something is kind of missing. And maybe that JSA is, you know, the, the key. Maybe it's that little puzzle piece that would sort of flesh things out in their entirety. At this point, we switch back over to Rorschach. And again, in this story, Rorschach is, is kind of taking up residence in Gotham, or I'm sorry, in uh, the, in Wayne Manor, only temporarily. Uh, but what we end up getting is the reveal of his face. Now, we don't get a name here. All we get is a reveal of his face. And the indication is that he is actually the son of Malcolm Long, that he is actually the son of the psychiatrist of, uh, of the original Rorschach. But we're not given a name, so we don't know for sure. The indication seems to be the play, it seems to be the case, you know, uh, we knew that Malcolm Long had a son, Malcolm Long and his wife were both African American. Clearly this version of, uh, of Rorschach is African American. We knew that just because of the reveal of his hand, but of course with the face and everything, we also know that's an absolute certainty. The, the clues are there and it really kind of seems to be thrown in our face, but it could also be a red herring. So again, until a name is dropped, uh, we're not given an absolute certainty, but you know, that kind of seems to be the case, which we can probably run with that. We can probably take that as, as some measure of a gospel truth. But the fact remains here, what we end up having is Batman going through the entirety of the original Rorschach journal and basically meeting with, you know, uh, this, this new Rorschach once he wakes up after having slept for like 24 hours. And it's intriguing because Batman basically says, hey, look, I think I know where this guy's at. Like, I know where Dr. Manhattan is. We have to go find Dr. Manhattan. And it's really, really cool because what ends up happening is he says, look, I think this guy is in this facility over here. So like, we need to go check this out. I'm pretty sure I know where he is. He leads Rorschach to this location, open opens the door, Rorschach walks in, and all there is is writing on a back wall that says, we're all mad here, and Batman shuts the door behind him and says, look, I'm sorry, but you belong in here. We end up finding out this place is Arkham Asylum, that Batman believes Rorschach is a crazy person, and as a result, just locks him up and throws away the key. And that's what's so interesting about this, is because Rorschach's not crazy. I mean, he is to a degree, assuming that this guy is anything like the original Walter Kovacs, like he is kind of crazy to a degree, but it doesn't mean he's wrong. A broken clock is right twice a day. And this guy's basically coming with news saying, hey, look, the end is at hand. The end is nigh. There's a being walking around in your universe that dwarfs all the power that you have. The events that you experienced in the button, the death of Eobard Thawne, being able to see your father, you know, this mysterious power source out there that destroyed the White Lantern Corps. I know what it is and I know what it's capable of, but Batman doesn't believe any of it to be true. He doesn't really think any of it's legit and ultimately kind of calls it a day. Bruce Wayne has not connected the dots. Now the question becomes, what happens when he does? Okay, so we are officially picking up with Doomsday Clock Part 4. I know it's been a little while since we've we've covered Doomsday Clock. It's being released like bi-monthly now, which is really disappointing because the story's so good. And like, I'm, I'm always on the edge like, like, dude, I really wanna know what happens next. Uh, but we are on Part 4. And this is the origin of like the new Rorschach. And this is kinda cool because what this is going to do is basically prove me wrong and prove a lot of people right. <laughs> and I know those are, there are those of you guys who were part of my channel who were just like, I don't care what happens as long as Rob is wrong. So like, it's, it's fun. 
fine. <laughs> it's not a huge deal to me. It doesn't really matter to me, but uh, this is cool because this gives us like the origin of this new version. Now, I remember playing a little bit of catch up for those of you guys who are, are you know, just now jumping into things or who have forgotten. Uh, the idea is that, that Jeff Johns is kind of blending the DC universe with the Watchmen universe. And we didn't know who this version of Rorschach was. All we knew was that Rorschach had just popped up inside of the Doomsday Clock stories. And of course we knew it wasn't like the original Walter Korvax because he died at the end of Watchmen. And so in this, the question everybody had was, who is this new version of Rorschach? What in the world is going on here? And so what this does, and, and it's a little, little confusing at first because it actually kind of bounces back and forth because of the fact that this version of Rorschach had basically appeared in the Batcave, had made his way in there, and then ultimately was, you know, taken by Batman and tricked into Arkham Asylum. Uh, he's basically just been residing here ever since. But what it does is it jumps back and forth between the past and the present. Now it's designed to be this way. Jeff Johns has been writing comic book stories long enough that if, if his intention is not to like create bewilderment, then he won't create it. And so the fact that this story has just kind of like bouncing around and almost leaving us with a state of confusion in terms of what's happening in the present, what's happening in the past, that's designed to be the nature of like the Rorschach character. His mind is quite literally a wreck. It's, it's absolutely decimated in so many different ways. And the reason for this is because what we do is we initially pick up when he was younger. Basically, he's the son of Malcolm Long. He's the son of the psychologist that was analyzing Walter Korvax, analyzing Ro the original Rorschach. And picking up with him, what we end up finding out is that when his father essentially took on the case of Walter, there were a lot of things that were going on in the background that, you know, Rorschach's, well, we'll just call him Rorschach for the sake of it, that Rorschach's mom was really kind of in a state of, like she was struggling because her husband was becoming more and more distant. And that was in the original Watchmen comic. Like that's the way that story originally went down is that Malcolm Long became more and more separated from his family. It became an obsession. The desire to learn about Rorschach and the desire to learn what made Rorschach tick, what made the original Walter Korvax tick, that became like the drive of, of Malcolm, I'm, I'm sorry, Malcolm Long himself or Reggie's dad. And so because that, it eventually drove a wedge between Reggie's mom and Reggie's father. But we didn't know the effect that it had on Reggie. And initially it didn't have a huge one. It didn't have a massive effect on him. He was just kind of watching things that were going on and he was sort of looking at these protests and so on and so forth. But all that changed in the attack on New York. When this monster was unleashed and this huge psychic backlash just swept across the city and killed three some odd million people, it had this massive effect on him because what it did is it drove him insane. It drove him crazy. He was one of the survivors of this whole incident. He was rescued by the cops. He was taken to an insane asylum. And that was really about it. He was kind of left there. In fact, he was taken to the same institution that Mothman was taken to in the Watchmen comics or before the Watchmen comics started. And so while the two of them were occupying a cell, what we end up having is we end up having this guy, Dr. Matthew Mason, who shows up. And this is kind of cool because what Jeff Johns does is he puts on this kind of show that like the cycle repeats itself, that Walter Korvax basically becomes a vigilante. He goes crazy. He ends up getting caught. Uh, he ends up being thrown into an institution. And then you end up having like, like Malcolm Long who shows up and Malcolm Long interviews him. And then Malcolm Long starts to become the new Rorschach. And that drives a wedge in his family. This cycle repeats itself here. Of course, Reggie's not married. He doesn't have any children of his own, but still the, the after effects, the impact of what Rorschach is and what it stands for is almost like this sort of virus that spreads throughout things. And even Reggie himself is having like these hallucinations. He's losing his mind. He's seeing like the eye of the monster and the forehead of Matthew Mason. This is the nature of things. And that's why this story can get a little bit confusing because it bounces back and forth between the past and the present. But again, this is designed to tell the story of how it was that Reggie Long met Adrian Veidt. And so in his effort to basically escape this mental institution, what he does is he incapacitates one of the guards when they show up with food or what have you, and then takes off to the roof of the building to try to get away. And in truth, it's really one of these things of like, I just want to get away from all this. Like, I want to be out of here. This is not where I belong. But when he gets up there, he basically ends up meeting Mothman. And Mothman's statement is like, I'm flying away. I'm getting out of this place. I don't need to be here. I'm perfectly sane. And he literally puts on like a moth suit or really just kind of like wings, like makeshift wings made out of bed sheets, really. And then just flies away into the moon where Reggie is basically taken by the security guards and brought back to the institution itself. Now, shortly after this, this is where things get cool. Shortly after this, uh, you end up having Mothman who's essentially caught by the cops when he's just outside of like this diner. And then he's brought back to the asylum and him and Reggie begin this sort of not really a father son relationship, but they begin like a friendly relationship. They start talking to each other all the time. Now for Byron, uh, Byron Lewis, he was a really interesting concept in the Watchmen stories. I mean, he, he came from a life of privilege. Like he never really struggled financially. And for him, like being a superhero initially was more like, hey, let's just go have fun. It was more like an adventurous sort of thing. Now that began to change when he joined groups like the Minutemen and then he stepped into the role of saying, well, let's actually do some good in the world, different things like that. The issue is that in the Watchmen comics, because the age of heroes wasn't met in the same way it was in like DC or Marvel, in the sense that like superheroes were effectively shunned, not really superheroes, but people who dressed in costumes 
were really kind of shunned. Eventually, what ended up happening is like when the whole anti, you know, superhero era came along, when the whole anti mask era came along, and even during the height of McCarthyism, what you had was Byron, who basically succumbed to like alcoholism as a result of like all the dangers and perils that went into being a superhero. And so the result was that he was confined to a mental asylum in Maine, which seems to be where this whole thing is going on. But the idea here is that he was always an exceedingly smart guy. And for him, it was a matter of like putting the pieces together and looking around and seeing everything that was going on. And where he is a person that plays the role of a friend to Reggie, what he ends up doing is he actually uh, manages to gather a whole bunch of Malcolm Long's belongings and bring them to Reggie. He basically gives his son his father's things. And so the result is that Reggie starts going through and looking at like the journal of Rorschach, looking at the notes of his father, listening to the recordings, all these things. And as time progresses, because of the fact that Reggie is in such a fractured, fragile mental state, what he ends up doing is actually adopting the persona and the personality of Rorschach. Now, again, this is cool because what Jeff Johns kind of teases here and really what Alan Moore was sort of shooting for was that anybody could be Rorschach. That was the point of the mask. Anybody could be behind that mask, but that's the basis behind this. That's why mass superheroes were perceived to be so dangerous is because nobody knew who they were. You're a copy editor by day and like a vigilante by night, just smashing people's heads in and breaking their fingers and thumbs and hands. Like that's, that's the whole thing that went behind that. And so for Reggie, like he kind of stands with this embodiment of Rorschach in the sense that at the end of the day, Walter Corvax was just a guy who had enough. In his mind, it was a matter of trying to find a way to curb the violence, so to speak. You know, being the killer who kills killers, if that makes any sense. And so with Reggie being in that state, being, you know, basically like victimized by the various authorities who were there, the orderlies inside the insane asylum being treated like crap, he just kind of falls down, tumbles down into this path of Rorschach, tumbles down into the role of Walter Corvax. Not only that, it's almost, I wouldn't go as far as to say it's a little bit of manipulation, but I would go as far as to say that when it comes to Mothman, it's intriguing because what he says is he, he starts going through and like there's this puzzle they're working on and the puzzle is ultimately the face of, uh, of, of Ozymandias and it's him basically saying if you know how to look at this picture the right way then you know what's going on and that's what happened with Reggie. Reggie just started putting all the pieces together. He looked at the journal of Walter Corvax, everything that was going on and said like this is the fault of Adrian Veidt. It was always the fault of Adrian Veidt. Initially he was kind of trying to figure things out and trying to work on things until he got to the end of the journal of Walter Corvax when Walter Corvax basically says like Adrian Veidt is the reason behind all this. And that's the funny thing is because no one else has quite figured this out yet. And the newsreels, there's indications, there's, there's, you know, people who are like speculating and saying, well, it seems like it's Adrian Veidt and super, you know, smart scientists and things like that. People who are trying to answer the question of what was going on, social psychologists and what have you are analyzing like everything that was taking place and saying, well, all the clues seem to point to Adrian Veidt, but Reggie Long is the only person that has incontrovertible proof that Adrian Veidt was behind it all. And that's where he full on steps into the role of Rorschach because now what he does is he looks around and says, there's a guy out there that killed 3 million people. What would Rorschach have done? What would Walter Corvax have done? Well, Walter Corvax would have killed him. That's what Walter Corvax believed needed to be done, that Adrian Veidt had to be stopped. So I'm going to pick up the slack. I'm going to continue on this mission of Walter Corvax. I'm going to kill Adrian Veidt. And at this point, it just breaks down to the question of how can it be done? How can it be pulled off? And this is when people begin to start realizing that Adrian Veidt's the one behind all this. That's when it really began to go topsy-turvy. Because remember, when it came to like the time gap between the Watchmen comics and the Doomsday Clock comics, we don't have anything to fill in that gap. All we have is what's been told to us by Jeff Johns and like what interviews have been done and what speculation exists on the internet. But by and large, this answers that question. It tells us that like at the end of Watchmen, the world was united in response to like this giant monster that killed 3 million people in New York. The world was united in mourning and the world looked to make the world a better place because people began to realize how fragile they were. And then the information came out that Adrian Veidt was behind it all. And then that fragility shattered and the world was worse off than it was before Veidt went through this whole scheme of unleashing this monster in New York. You know, because people realized they'd been tricked, they'd been duped. It wasn't an actual piece. And so in light of all this, what Reggie does is he actually sets a fire inside the institution and where he and Mothman are gonna leave and go find Adrian. Instead, Mothman goes back into the building and simply just allows himself to die. And so then you have Reggie who just takes on the whole Rorschach mantle and goes to find Adrian Veidt, who's basically on the Percy uh, Bice, this tanker out in the middle of nowhere. But when he gets there, it's intriguing. And this is where we start to get like the Reggie personality and the Rorschach personality who were a little in conflict. When Reggie shows up to kill Adrian Veidt, Adrian Veidt just kind of turns around and says, look, you can kill me if you want to, but like, I'm dying anyway. Like, it's only a matter of time before I die. Like, there's there's nothing that could be done. I've basically got brain cancer. And it's kind of cool here because in truth, like, if Adrian Veidt were going to die anyway, of what purpose would be served by Rorschach killing him? That's kind of the stance that Reggie takes. Rorschach kills people who would otherwise be able to continue on their normal lives, just doing whatever it is that they want to do all the time. But for Adrian Veidt, he's not really a criminal. He's not really a bad guy. And that's the reason why this, this whole situation works. That's, that's the reason why this is so cool. One of the classic examples in a situation like this is the trolley train, right? Like you're a trolley conductor and the brakes go out. Um, yeah, the brakes 
go out and all you have at your control is like the steering column and you can steer the trolley on one of two sets of tracks on one set of tracks is one construction worker and he's totally oblivious has no idea this trolley train is just hurtling towards him is going to smash into him and 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 kill him entirely but if you steer it to the other tracks there's five construction workers you have to choose between one or the other which one do you choose well you choose the one construction worker you kill that one guy in order to save those five guys it's utilitarianism and when you're adrian veidt and you're looking around and you say humanity there's there's seven you know seven some odd billion people or six or five or whatever the the absolute number count was at the time the story was written when you have however many billions of people in the world who are all going to be destroyed because the clock is inching ever closer to nuclear war between the u.s and the ussr then like what steps do you take to unite people people don't unite willingly anymore it doesn't work that way people have to be united when there's like a massive catastrophe what he needed was a catalyst he needed something that would force humanity to unite because they had to not because they wanted to and so that's what that monster was the monster showed up in the city of new york it killed three million some odd people and it was like oh my god you know the the terrible situation this is so awful you know and the humanity and so on and so forth but in light of how terrible things were and the massive amount of casualties humanity united and that was the goal of adrian veidt what he didn't pay attention to and what he didn't think about was the aftermath and that's the cool thing here is because this goes into that whole moral philosophy like like what what makes an act good is it you know the consequence or is it the act itself you know is it the intention behind the act if adrian veidt's intention was to unite humanity and make the world a better place he's a good guy if all you care about is the consequence the world's worse off after what he did than it was before he did what he did then then he's a bad guy he made things terrible but that's the difference here adrian veidt wasn't looking to rob people he wasn't looking to unleash a monster in new york and then steal everybody's valuables while they were all distracted he was trying to make the world a legitimate better place and so because of that like you kind of have to have pity on him and that's where he sort of began to give up that's where he looked around and said if humanity really wanted to unite it would have if people really wanted to solve the world's problems then they would have but they don't want to solve the world's problems they want to goose step themselves into nuclear war between the u.s and the ussr there's nothing that could be done whatever happens happens and that's why he teamed up with with reggie long and that's why he said we have to go find dr manhattan we have to bring him back what will happen when they do we don't know manhattan might show up and say well humanity is going to kill itself anyway so i'll just help them on uh, help them along a little bit and just wipe away the world there's any number of things that could go on in in like the whole watchman universe and so because of that what we end up doing is with the two of them teaming up and that of course is where doomsday clock number one picks up we jump back to the modern day here in issue number four after reggie had been thrown into arkham asylum by bruce wayne and so what is up happening here is basically he has a conversation with what appears to be saturn girl from the legion of superheroes because she's been locked up in arkham asylum the entire time that's where she's been this whole time that was teased back in dc universe rebirth number one and so what she says is like we have to get out of here like we have to make our escape she's already out like she's literally out of her cell and just roaming around and she's like we have to get out of here you know because i don't have that much time and whatever's coming is going to require like the entire superhero community if we don't work together we're all going to die and that's what's cool because it's basically saying like dr manhattan is coming here it's only a matter of time before he does and so the two of them basically team up and who knows what happens at you know we'll have, we'll have to find out in the next issue but what we also end up finding out and this is a cool indication here what seems to have happened is that dr matthew mason was a fictional person he didn't exist instead it looks it looks like it was alfred pennyworth although i still think it's batman but it looks like it was alfred pennyworth who was disguised as matthew mason who went walking into the insane asylum pretending to to be a psychologist trying to understand who rorschach is and that makes sense batman's not going to take that person throw him into arkham asylum and then just throw away the key and never ever ask any questions batman doesn't work like that it's always the significance of gathering information finding out as much as he can as often as he can and that's exactly what's been going on here they've basically been investigating reggie long without him knowing it and so that's where the question becomes will batman side with reggie or will batman stand against reggie Okay, so we are continuing on with Doomsday Clock. A lot of you guys have been asking where the Doomsday Clock videos have been. The story comes out every other month now, although I believe they've backed it up so that now that it's monthly. But it's one of those weird things where it was supposed to be monthly, it was supposed to last a full year, and uh, the way that DC seemed to be going is you had like the DC Rebirth Initiative, and it was like the Rebirth Initiative would end when this whole thing picked up. Basically, when, when Doomsday Clock concluded, that would go into the next phase of DC. But because it's been backed up, it looks like it'll stretch on for three years, so I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> comes out four times a year and it's 12 issues long so uh so yeah it's it's, it's kind of crazy it's, it's a weird situation but we basically end up picking up of course you know in in the aftermath of the last one now one thing to bear in mind here is that this really is like jeff john's vision like jeff john's and gary frank which by the way gary frank man this guy is just stupidly talented but it really fits into like the vision of what they have you know like if the watchman met the dc universe that's how this whole thing fits in but with adrian veidt when they crossed over into the dc landscape initially like he went to go check 
out Lex Luthor, and then of course Rorschach went to go check out Batman, and the result was that Rorschach was basically thrown in Arkham Asylum by Batman because it was like, this guy's a loon. This guy's absolutely nuts. Now, of course, Batman ended up following up, pretending to be an interviewer in order to get an understanding of Rorschach's mind. But what you had is Adrian Veidt, who basically took a bullet for Lex Luthor when he was shot at by the comedian. And again, it was a way for, for John to just start bringing in all these different characters and so on. So what this does is it basically picks up immediately after, or not really immediately, but it picks up shortly after all this with Adrian Veidt in a hospital. And so, of course, he's basically being guarded here. And the perception is that Adrian Veidt seems to be a metahuman. There's no actual indication that's the case. And in fact, Adrian Veidt himself doesn't actually have any powers. But the reason why he's perceived to be a metahuman is because of the outfit he was wearing. He was basically dressed as a, as a costume superhero. And so it was assumed he was a costume superhero and his powers were just unknown. And so with there being uh, additional security, of course, Adrian Veidt basically wakes up and then attracts the attention of a couple of guards by making it appear as though he's flatlined and then subduing them. Now, this is cool because this is like the small little things that go into what Jeff Johns does, right? Like Jeff Johns is one of these guys who's like a master storyteller when it comes to crafting comic book stories. Like him and Jonathan Hickman are like my two favorite comic book writers of all time with Scott Snyder and Al Ewing at a close second. So it, it, it's, it's cool when it comes to this whole thing because it's a way to basically say like, here's why Adrian Veidt is so interesting is because his capabilities are universal. Like it doesn't matter what he, like what universe he's in, his intelligence is there. But from here, of course, he grabs Bubastis, basically takes off out of the hospital and then goes about his own business. And so from here, we switch over to Lois Lane. Now, again, this is why I love John's writing so much is because everybody gets a little piece of this pie, right? Like everybody's in this whole thing. And the whole gist behind this is that it's all really focused on the Superman theory. Now, again, for those of you guys who are really, this is kind of what you're jumping into with this one. One, I would highly suggest that you guys go back and, and watch the other videos or, or buy the other comics. And two, the whole idea of the Superman theory is that someone somewhere had basically drawn the conclusion that all the superheroes in the DC universe, or at least a huge brunt of them, originate from the United States. And so where they do have their own origin stories, a lot of their origin stories are cloak and dagger in a lot of different ways. Someone as iconic as Superman is more well known, but Batman is an enigma. No one really knows Batman's Bruce Wayne outside of the Bat family. No one really knows what goes on with this character. And you have all these different superheroes who exist around the landscape, you know, and even super villains. And they're really a mystery to a lot of people. And so because of that, theories began to arise, the most prominent of which is that the federal government is creating metahumans. And so what you end up having is you have Lois Lane, who's really just kind of speaking with uh, Clark Kent about the whole thing. And then in turn, she basically goes to visit Lex Luthor, who of course is in the hospital as well. And the encounter between the two is actually really, really intriguing here because it's her really just kind of breaking down and, and going through step by step. And it's even like Lex Luthor himself doing the same thing. Now Lex Luthor, really the kind of revelation that, that gets dropped here, at least from Lex Luthor's perspective, is what he tells Lois Lane while Superman's listening to the whole thing is he's like, look, I don't know everything about the Superman, the Superman theory. But the whole point of Lois is that she believes Luthor is at the center of it. And that works because remember, this version of Lois Lane is from a quote unquote previous universe. But the Lex Luthor she's familiar with is the mastermind, the bad guy, the guy who's always pulling the strings. And so when she sees this Lex Luthor and she sees something like the Superman conspiracy, her thought is Lex Luthor has to be behind it. But the response of Lex Luthor is I'm not pulling any strings. I have nothing to do with this. I don't even know how far down this rabbit hole goes. The only thing that I can tell you with any real measure of certainty is that one, whoever it is is helping the federal government with these metahumans is a metahuman themselves. And two, they used to be a member of the Justice League. Now, one of the things to, to, to kind of bear in mind is that Jeff Johns plays it fast and loose. And that's kind of the cool thing is he throws out this possibility that maybe it really is all just smoke and mirrors. That maybe Lex Luthor is just kind of full of hoo-ha juice. He doesn't really even know what's going on. He's putting on a show to make it look like he's still, you know, Lex Luthor as he's always been and, and all that kind of good stuff. And so it works for what it is and it is pretty intriguing. But at this point, we pick up with a couple of things that are going on. Uh, really, one of the most notable is something that involves a guy by the name of Johnny Thunder. Now, we talked about him before in one of the previous videos. The idea was that Johnny Thunder basically was in possession of like a genie or a demon of sorts, whatever you wanted to call it. But basically like when that aspect of his personality came out, he was crazy powerful. And that's the funny thing here is he's an older man now. And it, it's really been that way ever since Crisis on Infinite Earths, right? Like you had Johnny Thunder back in the day and he was like a really, really powerful character back before 1985. And then when DC rebooted back in 1985 with Crisis on Infinite Earths, uh, Johnny Thunder came back, but he wasn't in the same capacity. Instead, he was just kind of 
like an older guy who was there. And so picking up with uh, with Adrian Veidt, of course he travels back to basically where, where the, the vessel first crashed that so they were flying, the ship of, uh, of Night Owl, which again, by the way, there's a handful of characters that we haven't seen here yet. Night Owl, we don't really know where he is. We have no idea where like Sally Jupiter is. These are characters that are basically just MIA and we don't really know what's going on. But of course he basically travels back to his ship and he's met by Batman. Batman, of course, has had the, uh, the, the, I guess the journal of Rorschach this entire time. And he's like, I've read everything about you. I know all about you. Now, this is the first time that Adrian Veidt and Batman actually meet. And there's going to be an amazing conversation that goes on between the two of them here in the next little while. But something else that I also want to draw your attention to is Saturn Girl. Now, of course, we saw in like the last story, the, the, the last little tidbit here, that Saturn Girl was one of the people who had been housed inside of Arkham Asylum. And she'd been there ever since Rebirth kicked off. And presumably even before that, but she was just Jane Doe. Nobody really knew anything about her. And that makes sense because Saturn Girl is part of the Legion of Superheroes. You know, this 30th, 31st century team that exists in the future. And it's basically like that universe, or I guess that future is an uh, iteration of the Justice League. Now, the Legion of Superheroes is something that we haven't really talked about before, but they have a huge following. But the whole idea of the Legion of Superheroes in DC Comics was one of these sort of combination test beds, as well as trying to figure out what to do next. In the sense that back in really the, the 1940s, you had the stories of Superboy. And the stories of Superboy were designed to basically say, here's what Superman was doing between the time that he first arrived on Earth and the time that he traveled to Metropolis and became Superman. But DC started to run into problems. These problems included things like continuity errors. The origin of a villain that Superman faces off against is told in, in uh, Superboy, but the origin in Superboy does not match the origin in Superman. Uh, the other half of this was that you can only ever really tell so many stories about Superboy's antics before even at that point in time, it stretches the limits of credulity. And so the question was, what else can we do with this character? And so because Superboy was so popular, DC brought in the Legion of Superheroes and then eventually sent Superboy off with the team and they were basically allies that would face off against various threats. And the popularity of Superboy elevated the popularity of, of the Legion of Superheroes and that led to them becoming some of the most, I really like one of the most iconic teams that DC's had in a long time. It's almost like this trifecta, the Justice League, the Legion of Superheroes and the Teen Titans. But the idea is that Saturn Girl's basically here. And this is really the first time that we see Jeff Johns addressing the fact that it is Saturn Girl. Now that was thrown out in, in DC Universe uh, Rebirth number one. But since then, she really hasn't been referenced as Saturn Girl. But Saturn Girl has the ability to read minds. And so when she's going through and, and really, you know, I guess reading the mind of Rorschach, that's when we start getting into things like Sally Jupiter. That's when we start getting into like all these different variations of characters that exist in the Watchmen universe that we would expect to see here. We haven't seen them and there's no information about where they went to, but we do know that like in some form or fashion, they probably do exist. And so again, from here, we switch over to Mary Annette and her husband. Now, again, these are basically like these old Charlton characters, but the fact that Jeff Johns rolled them into this story, as soon as they made their appearance, we knew right off the bat they were going to run into the Joker. It was only ever a matter of time. What we know is that when they started showing up, as soon as they arrived in Gotham City, as soon as they landed here, they started seeing these various villains or these various henchmen who were running around dressed as clowns. And their question was, who are these guys and why are they dressed as clowns? And the more they investigated, the more they basically learned about the Joker. And so that's when their question was, who's the Joker? Who is this guy? We want to meet him and see what he's about. We're going to put him to the test. And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we're going to find him wanting. Like that's, that's what they're shooting for here. And that's what they've been doing all this time. We want the Joker. And the best way to get the Joker's attention is to take what he desires most. And that's literally what they've been doing. They've been going through and causing all kinds of problems, robbing various places, busting into Joker's facilities, so on and so forth, just different things like that. And so the result here is that we basically pick up with, uh, really with like Ozymandias, Adrian Veidt and Batman having this conversation as they're essentially traveling around. And they're basically heading out to, you know, wherever it is they're heading out to. And as they have this conversation, it's amazing because really like Adrian Veidt raises like this concern that I've been arguing the entire time that Batman and, and really like the DC superhero landscape as a whole, and even like extending that to like Marvel comics. What Adrian Veidt says is like, on my world, on my earth, I made everything better. Like I weaned us off of oil. I weaned us off of gasoline. I basically improved the world in a variety of different ways. Nuclear disarmament. These are all things that were done by efforts that I put in. But here you are, a guy who dresses as a bat and beats up people in the middle of the night and your city is no better off than it was before you ever became a superhero in the first place. That Superman is really the only person who's been able to land in a city, take up residence there and make it safer just because Superman's so po uh, so powerful. But the response of Adrian Veidt is your your efforts are useless. Like you serve no real purpose here. You don't do any good for the city of Gotham. You're just another wrench in the works and that's it. And so that, that's when he kind of asked the question, what have you ever done to make the world a better place? How is the world better off now than it was before you showed up? And it's, and it's, it's a cool 
situation because it's not. The world really, like Gotham City is not a better place than before Batman got there. Batman hasn't done anything. He hasn't done any good. He's a dog chasing its tail. And that's when Vite really kind of brings up the idea of Dr. Manhattan and kind of asks the question, maybe that's why he came here. He really wanted to see why you guys are meandering around in such useless roles. Why you guys are spinning your tails. Like why you guys think you're actually affecting change when you're not doing anything at all. And what would lead you to believe that you're actually doing anything when the evidence shows that you're not. Like that's the cool thing about this. Because at the end of the day, Vite's whole stance is I failed. I mean, I tried to unite the world under a singular cause and it failed, but at least I did something. You're doing nothing. And that's the funny thing here because it comes down to the old adage, doing things changes things. Doing nothing keeps things exactly as they are. And so what we do here is we pick up with Johnny Thunder. Now the idea here is that Johnny Thunder has basically been trying to find the lantern of his friend is really what he's saying. You know, if I find my friend's lantern, I'll find my friend and I'll find the rest of my friends and I won't be alone. Basically, he's trying to find the rest of the JSA. Now, looking at things that we've seen from DC Rebirth so far, we know about a few characters here and there and where they're located at. For example, Jay Garrick is stuck inside the Speed Force because Dr. Manhattan won't let him leave. But characters like Alan Scott, all these different members of the, of the JSA proper, we don't really know where they are. And so with this in mind, we end up having like Johnny Thunder being chased by like a handful of uh, handful of criminals and like running through sewer systems and so on and, and, go, and cutting through corridors. At the same time, Batman's thrown out of the actual vessel by Adrian Veidt. And Adrian's just kind of like, best of luck to you, man, because all these protests and everything, it's all for Batman. They want him. Like they literally want him to, to pay for all the things that he's done. And so this is like an awesome segment because what happens here is that as Johnny Thunder's making his way through these sewers, he turns a corner and there's the lantern of Alan Scott. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, holy hell, like, holy hell. I can't believe, like we have the green lantern of Alan Scott. Like this is so cool because I don't know about you guys, but I look at stuff like this and it makes me nostalgic for an era of comics that I wasn't part of. You know, granted, Johnny Thunder can't do anything with the lantern, but we know where the lantern is. And if we know where the lantern is, then we can trace it back to uh, to Alan Scott and eventually figure out what's going on with him. And that's the big question that we're trying to, that we're trying to understand here, because if what we were told in DC Universe Rebirth number one is to be believed, then what had basically happened here is Dr. Manhattan had shown up on the scene, right? Like you had uh, the Flash Barry Allen who initiated Flashpoint, which is where he screwed up the whole universe. He tried to set things back. Things were supposed to go back to normal, but some, for, but you know, for some reason, Dr. Manhattan intervened. And so what seems to be going on here with regards to the other members of the JSA is that Dr. Manhattan basically wiped their, their existence from the minds of everyone and maybe even like cost them their own memories of who they are. And so, you know, Alan Scott has no idea who he is. He's just kind of floating around out there doing whatever it is that he's doing, working some job with no idea that he's the original Green Lantern. So it's, it's kind of cool. But then from there, you end up having like Rorschach and Saturn Girl who basically rescue him. And of course, Saturn Girl kind of makes a comment, look, these guys were all going to die of an overdose anyway, so the world won't miss them. And so picking up with, uh, with, with Marionette, it's awesome because what ends up happening here is that when they go through and they start causing all this havoc and they basically watch Batman crash down onto the bat signal, then they suddenly get a response from someone off, someone at a panel who simply just addresses them as you two, they turn around and we have the Joker. And this is amazeballs. This is why I love, I love Doomsday Clock so much, but I hate it at the same time because Jeff Johns ends it on the best cliffhangers. And it's just like, damn, like, dude, these two meet the Joker. The Joker's finally here. At the same time, Rorschach looks to, to, to Johnny Thunder and says, explain what this is. What is this lantern and how does this work? Give us an idea of what in the world is going on. And so it's so cool. Like it's, it's, it's really, really awesome. And it's one of the cool things about this is we get like all these cool elements to sort of roll over into the DC universe as we know it. I mean, it rolls into like all these uh, great concepts and, and kind of brings them all together and unifies everything in a way that we're, that we're hoping comes out of, or I guess will really lead into like the finalized version of the DC landscape post rebirth. Okay, so we are finally getting back into Doomsday Clock. And that's that's the crazy thing. Doomsday Clock comes out like once every two or three months now. Like it's uh it's it's basically a quarterly publication, right? I mean, this is kind of the weird thing. You know, if DC Rebirth is really going back to the roots of comics, it actually kind of makes sense that DC would do something like this. I mean, this is being done because of, you know, just delays in the title. But back in the day, like back when you had like the All-Star comics, like it was All-Star quarterly. Like you had quarterly comics that were released by Marvel, I'm, I'm sorry, by DC. That would usually feature like team-ups, different things like that. It was a cool concept. And in reality, I would 
wouldn't mind seeing DC bring back quarterly, you know, quarterly publications that are like big events or something along those lines. I mean, it doesn't need to be like Marvel where it's like a big crossover event every, every, you know, every quarter. I mean, that's, that's a little much, but it does fit in with the idea of fit in nicely with, with what DC is trying to achieve here. Now, uh, really in the, the last bit of Doomsday Clock, remember, this is really kind of Jeff John setting the stage for the post Doomsday Clock era of DC, which is to say what comes after Superman's conversation or, or really probably even battle with Dr. Manhattan. Of course, no idea how in the world Superman is going to win that fight. What this did is, is a, in a lot of ways, it picked up on uh, really focused on Mime and Marionette. That's really what a lot of, of, uh, of Doomsday Clock had done. But up to this point, we'd also seen like the return of Johnny Thunder, or at least we'd, we'd seen this character featured. We saw the return of uh, of the, the lantern of, of Alan Scott. So like we know Alan Scott's out there somewhere. It's kind of like these little bits and bobs, these small little tidbits that Jeff John throws in that it's like the return of the JSA. Now, in truth, again, when it comes to Mime and Marionette, uh, they're basically just, you know, they're copies of, what is it, Patch and Julie, I think it is, but they're, they're basically plays on characters that existed in Charlton Comics back in the day. But with Mime and Marionette, they're essentially new creations. And so we didn't really know what their story was. We didn't really know where they came from. But the last thing we'd seen is they'd found themselves rolled up in the Joker. And so, of course, when it comes to, to the character of Marionette herself, initially this picks up with this whole scenario of her father just at least seemingly being ransacked and her essentially watching it all. Now, what this does is it really like sets the stage for the tone of the story and really for the nature of them. Because what it means is it, it, it starts things off by essentially saying this girl comes from a very rough past. And that's one of the important things because what you've also got is the two of them having met the Joker. And that's the big difference here. That's really kind of how Jeff Johns juxtaposes the Joker with Mime and Marionette and says they're not actually the same thing. Because when we first saw them, when we first picked up with Doomsday Clock and we looked at Mime and Marionette, it's like, okay, so they're basically Jeff Johns version of what would what Harley Quinn and the Joker would be like. But in reality, that's not the case. That when it comes to the Joker himself, he's just an insane man. Depending on what origin you're reading, either it's tragic or it's just kind of how things fell. Now, the fact that Joker has a Batman, it's kind of something to notice here. <laughs> of course, we saw that play out in the in the last uh, in the last video that we did in the last story. So it's not like it's it just kind of came out of nowhere. But it's not like he's he's just like, oh, we got to take him and torture him. and We got to do all these crazy things. He's just like, yep, I got Batman business as usual. Like, that's kind of how it feels, because what this is Jeff John's doing is saying, yeah, Joker's got Batman and that's a big deal. But there's much bigger deals coming down the line, namely Superman and Dr. Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's it's like the one thing everybody's excited for. But from here, we basically end up running into a handful of henchmen, basically, of Mr. Freeze. Now, when the Joker comes across these guys, we end up finding out that Mr. Freeze is kind of vanished. Now, we'll find out where he went to. But they're like, Mr. Freeze is kind of vanished. Like, we don't really know where he went to. He went off the grid. He's off the radar. And so the Joker's response is, well, then join my crew. Now, it's one of these things where if the Joker comes across your path and he extends you an invitation to join his crew, it's not really an invitation you can turn down. Now, at this point, we switch back to the past of Marionette you know, with her, her, father essentially you know running this uh, shop called maze glass and it's, it's kind of interesting because what what happens there's another kid across the street whose family runs another store themselves now of course this guy is as most of you guys have probably guessed is essentially mine like he's he's the guy that will grow up to become mine but it's kind of cool because marionette an, like immediately takes a liking to him but the problem is that this kid doesn't really talk he doesn't really say anything and he's actually kind of astounded by like all these puppets and all these things that are there so again this is kind of jumping back and forth this sort of switching back between the origin of mime and marionette and jumping back to the current moment but one thing to also keep in mind here is that Mime and Marionette weren't really crazy. They're just kind of out doing their own thing, and they basically play up a gimmick that is in relation to their characters. Of course, Marionette, as we know, took up the mantle because she, her father was a was a you know was a puppet guy, and you know Mime doesn't really talk. So we know like the, the roles they play reflect the lives they've led. But they've never encountered anyone like the Joker before because remember, Mime and Marionette are basically displaced from the from the Watchmen universe, quote unquote, and so they're used to more like grounded people, like people who were villains but are really more of like fly-by-night villains. They're more, more you know, just kind of goofy or uh, they just sort of do things, you know? Like if a, if a crazy person decided to dress up as like a... as. You know, a gladiator and decide they want to rob a store. Like, that's the kind of villain that they're used to. They're not used to someone like the Joker. The Joker is so chaotic. The Joker is so unpredictable. It makes it, it makes it crazy. And when the option is given, like, hey, do you guys want to join my thing too? Joker's like, no, 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 no. You know, Mom and Marionette are like, no, no, we're not going to. But at the same time, they're also pretty intense because they basically escape the Joker's schemes by like poking out the eyes of one of the of one of the henchmen, uh, with Marionette decapitating the other. So it's not like they're helpless, right? It's not like, oh wow, this is a crazy situation, but I don't know how to deal with this. Not at all. 
The issue here is that when the Joker, you know, it really comes when the Joker takes out one of his own guys. That's really what kind of baffles Mime and Marionette to a degree, and even baffles the henchmen of, uh, of, of, you know, of Mr. Freeze. Because for the most part, it's kind of to be expected for us as the reader. But if your Mime and Marionette is just kind of like, this is a little weird. But the more they stay together, the, the more different they are, the more similarities they find they have between the other. But the fact remains here, jumping back to the past of, of Marionette, the really sort of coming together moment of, of Marionette and Mime comes in the fact that Marionette's basically being taunted by a handful of bullies. And so, you know, they, they literally like string her up. I mean, they hold her in place and just start beating the crap out of her when she starts to fight back. And so, of course, here comes Mime, cracks a bottle over the head of one of them, and then just starts beating him with a broken beer bottle. Now, of course, as we know, bullies don't get second chances. And so this literally leads to Marionette just like chasing this girl down. Like when she flees for her life, it, you know, she chases her down, just starts pummeling the heck out of her. She tries to apologize. And then in turn, like Marionette's like, do you have another bottle so we can help this girl finish with all of her living? And so it's, it's I mean, it's, it's like, it's pretty intense. But here's one of the other things to bear in mind too. Even at a young age, they're moving towards a direction where it's just the two of us. That's really kind of the, the road they're going in. And so it's, it's kind of cool because what ends up happening is, you know, following the Joker, we end up finding out that what's essentially happening, the reason why Mr. Freeze vanishes because all the villains of DC have, have essentially located in one place, or at least the most notable villains. But you have like Hector Hammond, basically the Earth-based villains, uh, Hector Hammond, the Penguin, Two-Face, you know, all these different guys. But they're all basically being led by the Riddler. The Riddler basically says like, we're all coming together to form our own secret society of supervillains or Legion of Legion of Doom or whatever it is that you want to call it. But it's basically Jeff John's way of saying like, this old formation of the villains banding together, you know, against like the superhero community is going to return. It's going to come back. But notice there's kind of a veritable who's who here. Like, for example, you have Dr. Savannah. Now, of course, we know Savannah is going to be here because of the fact that Shazam is coming back. But you've also got like, you know, Captain Cold. You've got Boomerang. Here's something else, too, that I don't believe has been introduced yet in the mainline DC comics. You've got the Judge of Owls, where you have the Court of Owls, and then you've got like the Monarchy of Owls or whatever in the world is called. Now you've got the Judge of Owls, which is basically the, the one person who's in charge of like all the owls of the Batman mythos that exist out there in, in the world. So it's kind of cool to see that expanded. But then you also see them hitting at Typhoon. Now, Typhoon's a character who's been around for a long, long time. So he's not really like a rework of Dr. Manhattan. But here's a funny thing. He could be. And the reason why I say that is... I mean, the clearest, the clearest similarity between the two is the color of their skin, the fact that they're both blue. But in truth, David Drake made his debut back in Flash number 294, way back in the day. So again, he's been around for a very, very, very long time. His power is just weather manipulation. He's mostly been a Flash villain, and his powers have been confined on a smaller scale. He's never really been like a major player. But in reality, it wouldn't be that hard for Dr. Manhattan to just like take out the original Typhoon, dress up as Typhoon, and then go into the main DC universe. The question is why? Like, why would Dr. Manhattan do that? Which is why it's really not a believable theory, but it, it is kind of a funny idea to sort of toy around with. But then from here, we basically switch back again to the origin of Marionette. And this is when we end up finding out that what had basically been happening at this time when she was a little kid is that her father was basically being shaken down by the cops. The cops were crooked. You know, they were they were coming in and they were just saying like, you owe us a debt, basically. Like, you owe us a tithe of sorts. Of course, they also end up dropping the news that this young kid, Marco, that, or Marcos, that his mom died. She essentially fell down a fire escape and that was really the end of her. But again, it's it's another one of these things where it's just like, they, they live a pretty rough life. There's a lot of really, really shady things going on here. Not only that, kind of jumping back to the to the current moment, we end up finding out this is not the first time the Joker's shown up with a Batman trying to get himself into this team, which is so Joker. It's, it's exactly what Joker would do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like from what we're being told previously, the Joker had shown up with like a prison guard from Arkham Asylum, dressed him as the Batman and said, I've captured the Batman. See guys, can I join your team now? It's it's kind of a funny little thing. Now, of course, this leads to a bit of a skirmish between like Typhoon and, and the rest of the villains because it's just kind of like, hey, look, you're Typhoon. Like you really don't need to be here, man. Like you're pretty small time. And then of course, in the middle of all this, Typhoon gets shot in the face. And this is when things really pop off because we end up finding out the person who shot Typhoon in the face is the comedian. And dude, okay, so this is, this is when things get so awesome because then it's literally a bloodbath he's just firing on everyone like all all these different villains he's taking every last one of them out now mime starts making his way over to try to take out comedian and marionette immediately calls him back but of course he doesn't necessarily respond instead like giganta gets in the way of uh of of you know comedian and then of course he kind of has to jump out of the way of her onslaught but from there like it's literally taking pot shots i mean it's just it's like it's like the punisher rolled into like the hideout of like all the marvel villains and just starts shooting everybody to pieces that's 
that's what the comedian is doing right now. Like he literally shows up in this place and just starts taking all of them out. But like most people here just kind of react the way you would expect. Like they just kind of scatter. But like for most people, they don't really know what's going on. The response of, of Marionette is, we have to get out of here. This is the comedian. He will kill us all. But notice this, where we as the reader would look at this and we would think that initially the Joker has more in common with Mime and Marionette than anybody else. The Joker actually has more in common with the comedian. That sure, the comedian is a vigilante, but it's like Mime and Marionette and the comedian both represent different sides of the Joker. But it's basically like, it's, it's him just, it's, it's a comedian like, hey, look, I'm going to kill you all. So like you can run if you want to, but I will find you. I'll track you down and then I'll, then I'll take you out. So it's, it's one of these crazy things because it's like, it's like, this is exactly how we would expect the comedian's arrival to unfold in the, this whole landscape of DC comics. And so again, switching back to this last, you know, this, this next little tidbit of, uh, of Marionette's origin, the cops show up again. But the issue is that the, the father basically stands up and says, I can't let you guys shake me down anymore, especially not in front of my daughter, because what she's going to do is she's going to grow up believing, give people whatever they want and life will be easier, which is a terrible way to live. The issue with this, the response to this is they grab, they grab Marionette, they bring her out and they're like, look, you can give us what we want or we will kill your daughter. What we end up finding out is that the, this guy, you know, that the father is essentially just kind of like, he's, he's, He's got a, an actual financial tie that he has to pay, money that has to be given, which is currently hidden inside the Night Owl doll, which of course, you know, they crack it open, they take the money out, and that's that, you know, they end up leaving. That's where he stores, you know, the extra cash. And so what ends up happening here is it's this situation where, you know, she goes and, you know, after this whole scenario, she basically goes and ends up hanging out with Marcos, you know, and starts, you know, poking around, asking questions. Can you really not talk? Like, what, what in the world's going on? She returns back to the shop, you know, after, you know, the next day or so, only to find that her father hung himself. And this is when things get really, really crazy because now it's just her. She's alone. There's there's no one else there. This is all that's left because her father leaves a note behind that says, look, you know, they, they would have never stopped coming. It's one of these things. If you give an inch, you give a mile. You give into them the first time and they'll keep coming back. The only way to make them stop is to get rid of them. But in this instance, I'm leaving you behind because now you can go out and you can make your own, make your own life. And so in response to this, where he says, empty the till, take the money and leave. When the cops show up to collect their tithe, she stabs one of them in the neck. Now, where the other one starts to panic, this is when like mime runs in, bites the other one, you know, offers himself as a distraction of sorts. And then like literally marionette comes running in with a basically with a with a marionette wire and strangles the guy to death so like right off the bat like it's basically just the two of us we're the like we're the only two in the world that we can count on this is it it's essentially like the fallout from this whole situation from their initial origin this sort of comes home to roost when they have this conversation because when they get back to their safe house she's like you you can't leave me like that like if i have if i don't have you i don't have anybody else like this is it because we end up finding out that following this they made their way on the street the best way they could they literally did what they had to do in order to make Make ends meet so it's it's one of these things where it's like like look it's just us like we have to stick together we're the only real connection the two of us have and we have to go find our baby together so it's a pretty important moment and it really gives a lot of depth to the character now from there the comedian comes like track them down the comedian lives up to his word and he's like i will find you literally track them down and says you guys can come with me and you guys can show me where ozymandias is or i can kill one of you and make the other show me of course in the midst of all this the comedian's essentially knocked out from behind and we end up finding the joker was the one who did it and so of course the the Joker steals the comedian's button and it's just kind of like, well, I'm curious about this Dr. Manhattan guy. Like, what's the deal with this Dr. Manhattan? Like, we should go find Dr. Manhattan. And this is awesome because what it means is the Joker will meet Dr. Manhattan. Okay, so we are picking up with uh, Doomsday Clock number seven. And this is actually kind of an interesting scenario here because what Jeff Johns does in this story is he messes with us. He really kind of toys with us a little bit and it's actually pretty cool. It's kind of cool to see him see him mess with things a bit. So what this does is this picks up with the Green Lantern of Alan Scott. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, of course, this is really kind of where we left off in the last Doomsday Clock story. And Jeff Johns picking up with this actually offers some pretty intriguing things. So the first thing I wanna do here is I wanna talk about something called the Justice Society of America. Back in the 1940s, when you had like uh, Gardner Fox and those guys who were really kind of creating, you know, DC characters and teams, the Justice Society of America was the first team that DC had. They were the predecessors to the Justice League. It's one of the big misconceptions that uh, a lot of non-comic book readers have is that the Justice League was the first big team. Not at all. The JSA were really like small time characters. You had like, you know, the the, the original Flash, Jay Garrick, the original Green Lantern, Alan Scott, Hawkman, different people like that. Um, I think the Spectre was part of it at one point. Maybe it was Dr. Fate. And then you got into 1960 with Justice League, which which gave us kind of like the second iteration of the JSA, but with a more popular team. Now, because of the fact that the original JSA for the 1940s in, in real time, the original JSA existed on Earth 2, which was a different universe, when DC got rid of the multiverse, what they did is they came back and they said, actually, the JSA were World War II superheroes. And so by the time Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman and Aquaman, by the time they'd risen to prominence and became superheroes in the modern era, the JSA had basically retired. Now, DC tried to come back and change that a little bit, but Jeff Johns is sort of bringing 
bringing that back in. And what he's doing here is he, he really kind of does it by way of Dr. Manhattan talking to us, and it's kind of a big deal. With the original Green Lantern of Alan Scott, it wasn't actually a Green Lantern per se. I mean, it was insofar as it was a, a red, or I'm sorry, a green meteor that crashed into Earth, and it was kind of a, a lamp that was turned into a lantern, but it wasn't until after, uh, really, you know, much later on in DC Comics that they actually rolled Alan Scott over into, quote-unquote, the Green Lantern Corps. Originally, his Green Lantern ring was totally separate from all the other Green Lanterns that existed out there. And so with regards to this, you got, you know, Jeff Johns kind of runs through the origin, which is pretty straightforward, but he says small things. Now, here's the funny thing about this, is that Dr. Manhattan says this in a way to where it doesn't happen in a linear fashion. And that's one thing to keep in mind, right? Like, he doesn't say, like, in, in 1940, this happened, and in 1950, this happened, and in 1960, that happened. He says, like, in 1940, this happened, and then in 1960, this happened, and then in 1950, that happened. Dr. Manhattan does not see time linearly. Dr. Manhattan sees everything all at once. He sees the whole span of time happening all at one time. The difference here is that he can't travel back and forth through time. He can only see it. And so because of this, it's really interesting here because one of the things he says is that we're in the in, originally when Alan Scott was a railroad engineer and had come across the Green Lantern, the, the actual lantern itself, what Dr. Manhattan did is he moved it so that Alan Scott never came across it. And that's kind of a big deal because what this means is that because Dr. Manhattan cannot travel uh, travel through time, but because Dr. Manhattan affected the ability for Alan Scott to become the Green Lantern, it means Dr. Manhattan had to have been there in that moment when that happened. And so it's kind of interesting here because this this seems to go and seems to really indicate that Dr. Manhattan was responsible for the creation of the DC universe. But what Jeff Johns is going to do here in a little bit is kind of say, actually, he's not. And that's that's kind of the funny thing about this. And so uh, what we end up doing here is picking up with like Saturn Girl and with uh, Johnny Thunder and with Rorschach and, and with Ozymandias. Again, they're all basically trying to track down uh, Dr. Manhattan. That's the real big thing that they're looking for here. And it's kind of an interesting scenario because what we've also been seeing kind of going on in the background is this scenario where it's like the Superman conspiracy, right? That like superheroes are engineered by the federal government, which is why so many superheroes operate inside the United States, because it's kind of a government-mandated initiative and, and so on and so forth. Now, the other thing about this is that in the original Watchmen comics, what you had was a character called Bubastis that was created by uh, created by Ozymandias, and it was just kind of like his attempt to create life, more or less. But following the death of that original Bubastis and his attempt to, like, destroy Dr. Manhattan, uh, what ended up happening is that uh, Ozymandias created a new version. But instead of this just being, being Bubastis, what it is, is really like a homing beacon. It's a device that would allow him to essentially track down Dr. Manhattan. And so like a, like a radar or like a, you know, a radar that might beep louder and louder or at a faster frequency as an object gets closer to it, what this version of Bubastis does is it kind of lights up a little bit more. Now, the other part of this is it also picks up with a comedian. Because remember, that also happened as well. And it's kind of cool to see Jeff Johns do this, where he brings in the comedian, the comedian assaults like a large majority of the various villains out of Gotham. And then when like Rorschach and everybody flees, you kind of see what comedian was doing in the background by way of like the news or something along those lines. And so switching directly directly over to Comedian himself, again, he's been taken by the Joker. And it's kind of cool to see this, because at the outset, you would think the Comedian would have a lot in common with the Joker, minus insanity, in the sense that the Comedian is very Punisher-like in terms of how he functions, or I guess maybe the Punisher is more like the Comedian in terms of how he functions. But the fact remains, the Joker is absolutely insane, and the Comedian picks up on that insanity almost immediately, and it's just like, let me out of here, get, you know, let me out of here, let me go back and do my thing. You know, Comedian's desire, you know, Eddie, Eddie Blake's desire to just kind of get out of there is first and foremost, but he doesn't function like a crazy person here. And Remember, that's the nature of the comedian. The comedian doesn't have the name because he's a spinoff of the Joker. He has the name because in his mind, like he's not really a tried and true nihilist. He just kind of looks at the nature of humanity and says, the only thing you can do is laugh about it. And so there are some similarities between himself and the Joker in that regard. He just lacks the kind of extreme insanity, narcissism, and borderline multiple personality disorder that the Joker has. And so it's, it's kind of interesting. But in the middle of all this, they're suddenly met by the arrival of Batman, who's basically been tracking the comedian. Now, of course, this leads to Batman basically taking them out only for, for Mime to basically fire off, you know, one of his invisible guns and seemingly take Batman by surprise. Now, again, it doesn't really kill him, but it is kind of cool to see Batman facing off against, you know, these these characters, Mime and Marionette, characters that he's never seen before. But still, when they when they finally secure the Green Lantern of Alan Scott, what ends up happening is that Ozymandias basically begins to bring the two together. And it's one of these things where, like, they're all kind of, like, in a mad dash to the same location because the cat's leading them to a place, and then you have Ozymandias following the cat. And, of course, what we end up finding out here is that where the Joker's going insane and Batman's facing them all, the cat has been leading Ozymandias to the comedian. And the reason why is because the cat picks up on these sort of residues, more or less, that, that are that are there, that are left by Dr. Manhattan. And so what Jeff Johns kind of does is in a roundabout way, he indicates that in some form or fashion, Dr. Manhattan brought Eddie Blake back. That either he brought him back to life or, or something along those lines. We're not entirely sure. When you end up having like Ozymandias sort of bringing the cat and then bringing the, the lantern together and all those different things, what ends up happening is you suddenly have, you know, a, a 
essentially Dr. Manhattan who manifests himself. And it's kind of crazy because the way that Jeff Johns does this is it almost seemed for an instant that like Dr. Manhattan was pretending to be the comedian. But then of course, when Manhattan's there, you have the comedian sitting in a chair. So of course that wasn't really the case, but it's kind of crazy because Manhattan, you know, the, the, the response of Ozymandias is we need to talk. Now at the outset, Batman's response is I know who you are. And it had been kind of cool to see a little more of an interaction between the two of them. But again, Jeff Johns is a slow build. He's a, he's a slow burn when it comes to writing. And so you're never really going to see like a four issue arc where just things just pop off. If given the opportunity, Jeff Johns seems to always deviate towards telling a longer story that's more thought out, that has a, a lot more dialogue and a lot more plot building to it, which is one of the things that makes him an excellent writer. You know, one of the, the best comic book writers to ever live. And so Dr. Manhattan grabs them all and just kind of whisks them away, you know, out to what seems like the middle of nowhere. And the response is, let's talk. Let's see what it is that you have to say. And where Ozymandias says, look, you know, the, the actual Watchmen world is in shambles. You have to come back and fix things. Dr. Manhattan's response is, no, I'm not going to. And this is where Jeff Johns kind of says that Manhattan didn't really create the DC universe, or at least it seems to be that case. When he says, I left that world for a reason and I came to this world. And so, it, you know, the, the, the statement really seems to indicate Dr. Manhattan came to the DC universe after the DC universe had already come into existence. Now, we don't know how early he got here. Dr. Manhattan kind of sees time in a non-linear way. And so where we would look at it from the perspective of, well, Dr. Man Dr. Manhattan got here like 60 years ago, from his perspective, he was just here. And so the way he talks here, that's really kind of the tools and the clues that Jeff Johns leaves to us to determine whether or not Manhattan created everything. And saying things like, I was at this point in time, I saw these things take place. It all kind of seems as though uh, Dr. Manhattan got here before superheroes came into existence, but after the after the formation of the DC universe. So it's kind of a funny thing because when he starts talking to Marionette, when the statement's made, I chose to spare you, not because I thought you were a great person or you deserved it, but because you were pregnant and I saw what your child would go on to do. We know that from her origin story in the earlier videos. And so when the question is asked, well, you know, what's my child gonna do? Manhattan responds by saying, well, which one? And then, oh, that's right. You know, you don't see time the same way I do. You're pregnant right now. Now it's kind of interesting the way that Johns writes the character of Manhattan. He does a great job doing it, but it's very, very difficult for writers to mirror the style of another writer identical. And when you look at the old Alan Moore writing of The Watchmen, the way he wrote Manhattan was very disconnected. But when you look at Manhattan here, there's a hint of anger. It seems like he's kind of irritated or, or angry with people. The other half of this is that you end up having like Rorschach, who's talking about, you know, Ozymandias and saying Ozymandias has cancer and Manhattan says, no, he doesn't. You know, and that's when Ozymandias drops the drops this big truth bomb and says, no, I never had cancer. When he's talking to Reggie, the new Rorschach, he says, no, I, I never had cancer. I said that because I knew needed you. And this is really, really, really important. At the, at the outset, it just kind of seems like, man, what a dick move. But this is insanely important because what this means is that it means Ozymandias is just as manipulative as he ever was. That he saw the opportunity to use Reggie, to use Rorschach for his own ends and took it. And so it means that like in, in reality, Ozymandias hasn't changed at all. He's the same person that we saw in the old Watchmen comics when he thought he was saving the world and, and set this monster loose in the city of New York. And he's still that same person. And Dr. Manhattan sees that and says, you're the same person you ever were. You know, you are coming here asking me to save a world that you couldn't save. Why would I do that? It's a laboring beast gasping for breath. Let that world die. And so when you end up having Reggie kind of freaking out on, on Ozymandias, it's interesting because what Ozymandias says is, is like you live up to your namesake, that you are really a Rorschach painting. You are a reflection of what you wish to see. And what he says is what you wanted to see was that your father and Rorschach were friends. What you wanted to see was that your father was championing Rorschach's cause and that you were going to pick this up as well. The reality of the situation is is that Rorschach destroyed everything your father stood for. He destroyed your, your father's desire to live a beautiful life. He left him as a fractured, broken man. You didn't see that because you didn't want to see that. And it's kind of a crazy scenario because when you think about that, it's it's kind of mind boggling. They're like Ozymandias makes these incredible, these incredible observations, but then you have Manhattan who sort of goes back to the old end of the Watchmen stories, you know, where he's like, you know, this time is, is like a time is coming when I can't see past what happens next. I can't see the future beyond this particular point in time. And he doesn't really tell us right off the bat why that is, it's just for some reason he can't see what's coming later on down the line. And so it seems as though some bigger threat, either from Manhattan or that will work through Manhattan, kind of seems to be an indication here. And it's kind of crazy, you know, when he starts musing about these things that he's seen, how he, how he perceives time, how all this stuff works, it really sort of hits home again. And so when you end up having, you know, him basically walking away and just saying, I'm done, and then just leaving and then sending everybody back, things just kind of go awry after that. People sort of regain their bearings and then everything just pops off. You have Batman and Joker who are dealing with Rorschach beating the crap out of Ozymandias. You've got 
got Mime and Marionette who take their leave. You've got all kinds of crazy stuff happening here. And so the Joker, of course, being as being as insane as he ever was, when you end up getting out there to uh, to Johnny Thunder, when you get up, end up getting out there to Saturn Girl, when Ozymandias shows back up, he's been beat to pieces. And so it's just like, what in the world's going on? But he starts hiding his thoughts from Saturn Girl, so she can't read his mind. Just different things like that. And of course, he turns against her and says, I have a plan. I'm going to fix everything. When he throws out Johnny Thunder, when he throws out Saturn Girl, he's like, I'm going to fix everything. I'm going to solve the problem of everything. And it's kind of crazy because following this, we pick back up again with Dr. Manhattan. And what he says that what he says is that this thing that happens in a one month period, basically it's the arrival of Superman. And for some reason, Superman is outrageously pissed. And of course, this comes by way of Reggie sending off information to Lois Lane. So that's how we end up getting Superman into the mix. But the idea is that Superman, for some reason, gets it's so astronomically pissed off that he shows up here. He, he basically goes to punch Dr. Manhattan and then everything goes black. And what Manhattan can't figure out here, and this is what's so intriguing, what Manhattan cannot figure out here is if everything goes black because Superman destroys him with a single punch or if everything goes black because he destroys Superman and everything else. And so Jeff Johns leaves it so ambiguous because if I'm if, if I'm a betting man, I would bet all the money in my pockets to all the money in your pockets, which is zero for me. I don't know about you. Most likely what's going to happen is, is, is if Superman fought Dr. Manhattan, Superman probably wouldn't win. You're talking about a guy who can control the atomic structure of matter against a guy who can just punch really hard. And so when you have those things kind of thrown together, it's really kind of an obvious choice on who's going to win, but we don't know what state Superman will be in. We don't know if he'll have augmented powers. We don't know if Jeff Johns is going to amp him up to a higher level than we've ever seen him before. It'll, if it'll be one of those things where Jeff Johns has Superman pull out all the mental blocks, so he's running on 100% power and it's just astronomically insane in terms of what he can do. We don't really know. Okay, so getting into Doomsday Clock, God, this this is kind of a slow build, but it is really starting to pick up. We've got about four more issues, and uh, at the end of this, this is like something really, really big happens, uh, which is kind of cool. But this initially picks up with Lois Lane and Clark Kent inside the Daily Planet. Now, the way that Jeff Johns start this it starts is really kind of like Lois Lane getting yelled at, you know, for a story, and nothing really crazy, nothing bonkers from what we would normally expect to see with regards to what goes on in the Daily Planet between Lois Lane, Perry White, Clark Kent, you know, the various reporters. But in the middle of all this, we end up finding out that Firestorm Ronnie Raymond is in Russia. Russia fighting his arch nemesis, Pozar. Now, the reason why this matters is because this ties in to the Superman theory. Now, for those of you guys who, who, are, who are kind of jumping into this, in Doomsday Clock, one of the things that Jeff Johns has established is that there's this theory that's circulating around the world very, very fast that various metahumans are basically American-made, that most metahumans, 90% of them, in fact, exist inside the United States. And so the argument is the United States government is creating metahumans. Now, for the most part, this isn't really the case. I mean, various characters like Killer Frost or a byproduct of experiments gone wrong, but for the most part, most metahumans don't seem to be like part of a government conspiracy or anything like that. It just happens to be that in some form or fashion, they're tied into some government project or something like that. But we know Superman is from a different planet. We know that, that people like uh, Ronnie Raymond are the result of an experiment gone wrong. We know that, that, that these characters are not tied into the Superman theory. And Ronnie Raymond has publicly denounced this time and time again, but really kind of like leads the battle directly against Russia. And the reason why is because what the Russian government's been doing is implementing metahuman law. And what this basically means is that babies and various people are being tested for a metahuman gene, and if they test positive, they're being taken into custody, and no real questions are being asked. The other half of this is that Russia has been drumming up anti-metahuman hysteria, really like feeding on the fear of its own people. And so the result of this is that the, um, the the Russian people are very much against metahumans. So when Ronnie Raymond shows up, they immediately turn against him, and the result is that when he's essentially knocked down by Pozar, he's surrounded by all these various you know people, protesters, so on and so forth, and the result is that he kind of lashes out and turns them all to glass. Now, for the character of Ronnie, this can be brought about by a couple different explanations, two main explanations. The first is that it's a byproduct of his ability to transmute matter, which is the most likely explanation here. The other part of this could just be extreme heat, that it's literally, he let off such an astronomical amount of heat that these folks all turn to glass. Now, in truth, you're talking about something, that, you're talking about something to be equivalent to a nuclear explosion. So the fact that there are still, like, buildings standing and, like, the entire place is not totally incinerated is an indication that, of course, it's just the transmutation of matter. But what this does is to everyone watching, it makes it look like Ronnie Raymond killed all these people. The Firestorm, an American superhero, flew to Russia and then killed all these various people. It gives the Russian arguments credence, is what it does. So, of course, this leads to Ronnie Raymond fleeing. Now, what we end up having is Superman, who's watching the entire thing unfold, who leaves a daily planet, and travels to Kondok. And this is kind of a cool a cool moment here. Now, for the character of Black Adam, because what I'm about to say next, I want to go ahead and, and kind of, you know, uh, kind of instill this in, in 
you guys, Black Adam has been around since 1945. He's been around for a very, very long time. But Black Adam and Magneto are very, very similar in this regard. Uh, the reason why I said why I state when Black Adam would show up is because somebody would be half listening and then just be like, he's nothing like Magneto. Magneto came way after Black Adam. You know, what are you talking about? This, of course he did. I know he did. But the fact remains with, with Black Adam and Magneto, they're very, very similar in this regard. When it comes to when, when it comes to Black Adam, while he is con technically considered a villain, it's really only one of these things where like he'll fight against you if there's a legitimate threat to conduct. That's where his loyalties lie. Do not attack him. He will not attack you. Not only that, what, what Black Adam had basically done was open the doors of conduct to those individuals who were looking to find an escape from general society. Because with the Superman theory being so popular, what this means is that a lot of people are siding against it. Like a lot of people are siding against metahumans. And with them siding against metahumans, it's given metahumans reason to fear for their lives. And so finding some place to flee, conduct was opened up as a safe refuge of sorts. Now, here's the other important thing too. Lois Lane had basically received this package, you know, that kind of came out of nowhere with a USB drive. And when she plugs it in, this USB drive contains information about the Justice Society of America. And Lois Lane has no idea who that is. Now, we know this because with what's going on, what we've seen so far, Dr. Manhattan had changed things, right? Like Dr. Manhattan had moved the lantern out of the way. So Alan Scott never became the Green Lantern. And in fact, died before that could happen. Uh, we know things like, like Johnny Thunder was, you know, like he was a, a hero at one point, but he's basically largely been forgotten. The Justice Society of America has long since been forgotten by people. And it's basically Jeff Johns and DC's way of explaining why we haven't really seen them since the New 52. I mean, we got Earth 2, but that's a different, that's a whole different version of heroes. It's a different version of Jay Garrick. It's a different version of Superman, the whole nine yards. The JSA, as we know them, which is to say the team that people remember from before the New 52, back during the 90s, during the 80s, and way before the 80s, and so on and so forth, that team's been gone for a long time. And so while they are making their return, what this does is it establishes the JSA did exist, which means the question becomes if they existed and there's there's factual documented evidence of their existence, then why doesn't anyone remember them? Why don't people like Hawkman remember being part of the JSA? Because Hawkman's still alive. So why don't why don't they remember, you know, why doesn't he remember being part of the JSA? Why are those memories gone? Now we can largely assume that feeds into like the 10 years lost from everyone, but unless the JSA only existed during those 10 years, then we have to believe they existed beforehand, which means that they've been wiped away from the minds of everyone, something that seemingly only Dr. Manhattan would really be able to pull off. And so again, it's really kind of thickening the plot, basically bringing back a lot of these older characters, establishing who they are, what they're about, but also saying like, they were here once, so where are they now? And so again, we, we know characters like Jay Garrick is stuck inside the Speed Force. We know that like Alan Scott doesn't exist. We know different things like that, but like for the other members who were out there, the other characters, you know, who were, who were part of this whole thing, you know, where are they? Our man and, and so on and so forth, you know? And so uh, what ends up going on here is Superman goes to locate Ronnie Raymond only to find out that his powers are basically running amok to a degree. They're really kind of going a little bit bonkers. And where Superman's able to kind of talk Ronnie Raymond down and have him work alongside Professor Stein and basically transmute this kid back to his normal human form after having been turned to glass, this kind of feeds into the nature of Superman's character. Now, this is very, very important because when it comes to Superman in DC Comics, he's not so much a father figure for the various superheroes so much as he is kind of like the penultimate hero, right? Like the, the leader of it all. The kind of, the guy who kind of inspired everybody else to become a hero. And it's one of the characters they kind of look up to. But this is Jeff Johns establishing the nature of Superman, kind of reminding us what Superman's about, because this will probably become uh, important later on when we end up inevitably having the fight between Superman and Dr. Manhattan. And so it's kind of a cool little thing here, because when this kid gets changed back, what it does is it sets in motion the idea that Ronnie Raymond can set everybody else back to normal back in Russia. And so where he ends up traveling back there, of course, Superman arrives first. And this is a very important thing, because when Superman shows up here, our initial inclination might be, okay, well, you got Vladimir Putin, who's existing, you know, the current guy in, in, in Russia, you know, running the show. And, and then it's like, okay, Superman shows up. We're clearly they're going to, going to attack him. No, they're not. And that's a very important thing because Superman is a hero who's beyond reproach. You know, his stance, where he resides, that is that is beyond contestation. Everyone knows Superman is a protector of Earth. He's a savior of Earth. No one questions his loyalty. No one questions his role. He is definitively a good guy. And when he shows up here and the other members of the superhero community in Russia intend to attack Superman, Vladimir Putin steps in and says, absolutely not. Superman's a good guy. Superman is definitively a good guy. But with Superman showing up, what he basically does is say, look, the whole incident with Ronnie, Ronnie, uh, Ronnie Raymond with Firestorm, this is an accident. It's one that can be undone. And when he makes this statement, it is, okay, well then let's see what the guy has to say. Now, the funny thing about this is that Batman's watching the whole event unfold. And Batman, as he's talking to Superman, his response is, do not pick a side. Do not make a definitive 
declaration. And that's the important thing to bear in mind here. This whole thing is called the Superman theory for a reason, that it all hinges on the idea that it all started with Superman, right? Like Superman was the first hero, first superhero to operate out of, you know, seemingly operate out of Earth, or at least the most popular to operate out of, uh, out of the United States. And so the result is that it all kind of centers around him. For him to make a declarative statement, the Superman theory is false. The Superman theory is wrong. The demonization of metahumans is wrong. It's to pick a side. It's to basically say anyone who is in favor of the Superman theory is incorrect. The problem is they don't have enough information here. And that's why Batman really takes a stance and says, do not pick a side because you could be wrong. And if you're wrong, you're going to have egg on your face. And if you're wrong, people are going to look to you. They're going to point the finger and say, see, even Superman doesn't really know what's going on. Like he's, he's clueless. Like the government's just that secretive, this, that dark and manipulative. But Batman keeps harping on him. Do not pick a side. Do do not pick a side, do not pick a side. Ronnie Raymond shows up and says, look, I can fix everyone. I can set everything back to normal. One of the soldiers pulls the trigger, fires a shot, and Ronnie, you know, you end up having Superman who kind of jumps in the way and protects him, but Ronnie Raymond is attacked by Pozar, and then in the middle of it, it really all seems to pop off. And that's why this whole thing, that's one of the big reasons why Batman said, do not pick a side, because this will, this will inevitably lead to a conflict. And if it does, then it will be spun. News companies exist to sell themselves. Facts be damned, they exist to sell themselves by any means necessary, and they'll spend the story however they have to in order to sell themselves and so that's why this this whole thing is a is a huge crapshoot because the way this looks is ronnie raymond basically killed a whole bunch of people by turning them into glass superman shows up and says not only is, is can this be reversed is you know are you guys wrong for demonizing ronnie raymond the superman theory is false ronnie raymond shows up all hell breaks loose superman takes sides against the russians it looks like the united states government is acting against the russian government it looks like metahumans are trying to destroy people who disagree with them that's how it appears and in this instance ronnie Ronnie Raymond begins to basically start snapping, right? He begins to kind of lose his mind, begin basically powering up, letting off this energy. And what ends up having is Batman chimes in and says, Superman, you have to stop. Energy levels are spiking. Superman's idea is that Ronnie Raymond's powering up and Ronnie Raymond is about to destroy everything. And the response of Batman is, it's not Ronnie Raymond. And that's when we're met with this massive surge of blue light and everything's gone. Seemingly, Dr. Manhattan has stepped in. Now, we don't know what role Dr. Manhattan's taking here. All we know is that at this moment, Dr. Manhattan is chosen to make his move, and we have to wait until February to find out, which sucks. Let me tell y'all something. Man, man, let me tell y'all something. Y'all ever read a story that was so good you want to punch a hole in the wall? That's exactly what this is. Man, dude, if, if God were writing comic books right now, this is what it would look like right now. Okay, so this story picks up... <laughs> <laughs> in the year 3019 and dr manhattan's just like okay so basically like the earth is going to be threatened and like a guy you know tries to protect it and basically dies in the process but the crazy thing is like the energy that this guy lets off basically like sends the rain careening back through time right and then dr manhattan's going through and he's like okay so like it's basically like the the cascading effect right like he's like okay this guy exists because of the fact that alan scott exists right but like i moved the lantern out of the way alan scott never became the original green lantern which meant that alan scott never founded the original JS which meant that like this legion of superheroes never existed like it's literally just kind of analyzing the effects of his own actions but remember because of everything that's going on dr manhattan cannot see the end of all things and he doesn't know if that's because of the fact that he gets killed by superman or dr manhattan destroys everything in reality so it's kind of the coolest thing and so remember this comes after firestorm had basically like let off this massive explosion in russia uh which he was kind of tricked into more or less and then in turn like the world kind of turning against superheroes more so than they already were because for those of you guys who were just kind of catching up for those of you guys who haven't read this, the Superman conspiracy is the on-running theme in Doomsday Clock. The idea that, like, there's this conspiracy running around that, like, all superheroes or almost all superheroes were created by America, by the American government. And so with the explosion that happened in Russia and all the other superheroes basically kind of banding together, what we end up finding out here is that, like, everyone has come together. And when I say everyone, I mean, like, everyone. Like, the Justice League Odyssey team, the Justice League of America, like, all the magic wielders, all the super, all the members of the Superman family, like, everyone is here and everybody's trying to figure out what in the heck is going on and so it's kind of it's 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 amazing here because while all that happens like you literally have like dr manhattan who's just kind of musing to himself he knows exactly what's going to take place but he's just kind of musing to himself with like everything that's going on with regards to like earth and the superheroes and so on and so forth so detached and not really concerned about anything that's going on it's just kind of there like i wonder what'll happen next and really just kind of concerned about like why he can't see the future and it's kind of nuts because like while all that goes on of course superman's recovering 
Batman's recovering. They were both in like the immediate vicinity of the explosion. But then like Lois Lane goes running to his side, right? And like that's really what's kind of going on is like all these themes are effectively coming to a head that you've got the president of the United States being addressed by like his cabinet, basically being told because of the explosion in, in Russia by Firestorm, Firestorm's a metahuman. The Superman conspiracy is already running strong. People already distrust superhumans. You have to do the only thing you can do if you want to keep the White House. They're basically kind of asking him, do you want to be political or do you want to be moral? You can't be both. And so the president chooses, or at least it seems like he chooses to be political. Their argument, the argument of his cabinet is you have to stand against metahumans because that's what the general public wants. And at the end of the day, you're a servant of the people. You have to do what the people want you to do. The people want you to basically enact or at least present legislation to Congress that forces metahumans to reveal their identities, that basically removes the ability for people to have masks. It's Watchmen all over again. And it's so cool here because then in turn, you basically have like Bruce Wayne waking up inside Wayne Manor and, you know, of course, like, you know, addressing Alfred and so on and so forth. All these things are kind of happening at like a really, really fast clip. And that's one of the things people tend to forget. And somebody actually made a comment about this on Twitter, which is true, that one of the things people tend to forget about the Watchmen is that it was it was a slow build, right? Like it was like the slowest story ever until you get to the second act and then things pop off. But basically what Batman essentially says here, like address, like talking to Alfred is like, what's going on? Because humanity has taken all the all the various superheroes who were essentially like traveling out to Mars. Cause that's basically what's happening. Like what Batman explains here is that like after the whole event with Firestorm, that like the source of energy that seemed to basically cause Firestorm to explode, or at least was deduced to believe to cause Firestorm to explode is coming from Mars. And that's where all the superheroes are going. They're all going to confront Dr. Manhattan. And so with Batman and Superman being the only two left behind on Earth alongside Wonder Woman, and I guess Green Arrow, is that what, what's basically going on is he's like, look, I don't know if that energy signature coming from Mars is the one that actually caused all this. I don't know if that's what's really going on. There is a massive energy signature out there and it does warrant being investigated, but like, I think the Justice League is getting played. And it's kind of crazy because that, that in turn basically leaves the entire Earth vacated. It leaves the entire Earth empty. And so in, in response to this, like Batman's like, we need to send a message off to them. And so it's kind of cool to see this because when this happens, we kind of transition over to like everybody but Batman, Superman, and like Wonder Woman. But like when they arrive on Mars, it's all the Green Lanterns. It's it's the whole nine yards. It's the whole kit and caboodle. And it's this awesome thing because while that happens, you've got Lois Lane standing over like the hospitalized body of Superman in the, in the Hall of Justice. And it's just this voice that comes out of nowhere that says, hello, Lois. And it's Lex Luthor. And it's like, okay. So like Lex Luthor's making a move now. Because that was my thought. My thought was like, okay, so Lex Luthor's basically going to like kill Superman now. Like he's in a super weakened state and Lois, Lois Lane's like, you don't have a chance. You're not pulling this off. It's crazy. I mean, like Roddy Raymond Firestorm is still alive. They're in separate bodies. They kind of have to merge in order to, to pull off whatever it is that they want to pull off. But still, like Roddy Raymond kind of beseeching Martin Stein and saying, look, like we have to reform his Firestorm. We're almost like a reality where we can rematerialize matter. Like there's almost no limit to our power whatsoever. Like we have to basically work together here. The Green Lanterns create like this giant field around Mars. Like all these steps are being taken by all these different, these different individuals here to like safeguard themselves. It's this huge buildup. Everybody's preparing for like a massive battle against like this one guy. But the first one to speak up and talk is John Jones. But where they're all like, hey, like who are you? And, and what are you doing? Why are you here? Lockman like, Hanscom, like I've got stuff to do. Like that's basically kind of his response. It's like, hey man, like, I, you know, look guys, like it's cool you're here, but like I've got bigger fish to fry besides you. And that's that's what's, that's what's so interesting about that is how like dismissive Dr. Manhattan is of like the, of the, of a veritable who's who, because everyone is here. Everyone but the villains are here. Like every single superhero on earth is here. And like Dr. Manhattan is just dismissive. And we find out why quick, fast, and in a hurry. It's so cool because Guy Gardner, the Green Lantern steps up and it's just like, okay, hey, look, man, here's the rub. It seems like you've done some pretty shady things. So before, before you make a move, I want you to understand what it is you're getting into. We've crushed all kinds of people. Dark side, the anti-monitor, a multiversal threat, some evil versions of Batman, evil versions of Superman. We've beat the Sinestro Corps. We've beat Doomsday. We've beat all those, all those guys. Dr. Manhattan addresses John Jones and says, the reason why he's worried about me is because he's worried about this one vision he can get from me, which is my final view of Superman, like Superman racing towards me and trying to kill me. And so it's kind of nuts because like as things go on, like Supergirl responds, she's like, so you think Superman's going to kill you? So you want to kill him first? Like Firestorm freaks out because he thinks Dr. Manhattan's been screwing with him and caused him to blow up. The guy Gardner just wants to fight some stuff. So he's like, okay, come on, let's do this. He punches Dr. Manhattan, knocks him out. And then Manhattan vanishes, reappears behind him and destroys his ring. And it's like the coolest thing because he's like, let me remind you of your place in the bigger picture. And he's just like, bam, like, like just crazy. He's like, I'm curious. This ring that you wear has power inside of it. And while I'm not the, like the slightest bit worried about it, I am curious about it. So like, let's just take it. And it's just like, this is interesting. Like,
effect. And initially, he's kind of like, I found it difficult to affect. But here's the funny thing about this, right? Like, it's not Dr. Manhattan in try hard mode. It's Dr. Manhattan in like laid back mode. Let's just casually destroy some things. And then, like, all the magic wielders bust out. And he's just kind of like, This is interesting. You guys think you're wielding magic because you're not really wielding magic. There's no real magic here. There's just you basically using reality warping on a small scale, but only able to, to control what's left of the universe. You guys are able to, you guys are able to manipulate the leftovers of the universe, just like you're the leftovers of the superhero community. Dude, he's talking some mad trash. In one fell swoop, he's just like, boom, and just, and just sends them all flying. These guys were ill-equipped to deal with the power of Dr. Manhattan. That's exactly what this is. Now, kind of switching back over to, to Lex Luthor for a second. So he brings something up here. He basically says, like, I'm the one who gave you all the footage of, like, the heroes who were supposed to exist, like the JSA that was supposed to exist. I'm the one who leaked it all to you. All the evidence that I have points to this man that the Justice League is basically going after, who's essentially, like, been meddling with the time stream. And then he asks her a question. He says, have you ever heard of someone named Wally West? Now, this is big because remember iris west barry allen and kid wally west kid flash they're really the only ones who know but there's only like a very small number of people who know about wally west lex luther is kind of spilling the beans to lois lane and basically saying like here's everything that's going on now this is where things get interesting and probably where like the old school Watchmen fans will get a little pissy but what happens here is like firestorm jumps in goes to attack dr manhattan says like you don't know who you're facing off against and manhattan's like no you don't know who you're facing off against and this is when things get a little strange because what seems to happen here is dr Dr. Manhattan yanks Ronnie Raymond into the past. That's kind of the big caveat here, because as I understand it, when it comes to Dr. Manhattan, he moves forward in time at the same rate as everybody else. Dr. Manhattan cannot travel back and forth through time. The thing that Dr. Manhattan does is he perceives all moments in time happening at that moment in time, right? But like today's Wednesday and it's March 6th. So for Dr. Manhattan, today's Wednesday and it's March 6th, but it's also every day that will come after and every day that came before. But tomorrow, Dr. Manhattan will be in March 7th. Dr. Manhattan cannot jump back to March 6th from 2018. He can't really like time travel in traditional sense. That seems to be the case with this character. He doesn't really perceive it in a linear fashion, but he cannot travel back and forth through it. And so it kind of seems to be hinting at the idea or at the very least outright stating Dr. Manhattan can time travel. And what this is designed to do is to kind of play mind games with Ronnie Raymond, but at the same time, kind of like retell his origin to a degree. The idea that instead of Martin Stein and Ronnie Raymond kind of bonding together in an accident, that it was intentionally done. That, that it was literally done in a way to where Martin Stein wanted to create a character like this, and he needed someone who, who, who would most likely bond to him. And so ultimately he chose Ronnie Raymond because Ronnie Raymond, one, reminded Martin Stein of his own son, and two, was in need of a parental figure. And what this does is it reshapes everything. It literally changes the way that Ronnie Raymond views himself and views Martin Stein. And almost kind of like sends him on a warpath, which he does. I mean, he literally like freaks out and he ends up attacking Dr. Manhattan. Now, this is when things kind of shift back. And that's when the perspective, that, that's really when Jeff Johns, I think, kind of clarifies things. That where we would look at that initial encounter, we would say, okay, so I guess Dr. Manhattan can time travel. That's not what happened. Presumably, what seems to have happened is that in the blink of an eye, Dr. Manhattan basically sent the mind or at least gave Ronnie Raymond like a portion of his power. And essentially, like Ronnie Raymond saw time in the same way Dr. Manhattan does. But instead of seeing everything happening at once, he basically isolated to a single perspective or a single point in time so in reality they never left the present it's just that how Roddy Raymond saw time basically meant that like in his mind's eye he was looking at seven years ago to his own origin how it was that he came into existence and the basis behind his creation and it's kind of cool because when Roddy Raymond attacks like the rest of the justice well really the rest of the superhero community takes it as their chance to make their move and like the whole battle pops off and like everyone is in this, right? Like all the Green Lantern, Supergirl, the entire Shazam family, they all basically channel it into Dr. Manhattan. This massive explosion goes off and Dr. Manhattan basically seems to die. The entire superhero community presumably kills Dr. Manhattan. And while that goes on, like all these different things are happening at the same time. Like Wonder Woman's making her address to the United Nations. You've got like the superhero community that's celebrating the fact that they killed Dr. Manhattan. The message Batman wanted to send to them to tell them they were being played was like basically it failed to send and then Wonder Woman's met from nowhere and Dr. Manhattan reconstitutes himself and literally in one fell swoop defeats the entirety of the superhero community with a wave of his hand they're all gone and that was kind of solidifying the fact that dr manhattan was just playing games it wasn't dr manhattan fighting to kill it was dr manhattan being curious but like he's not curious anymore be gone and like they're all like they're all out like that's basically it not only that when wonder woman is making her address because of the fact that all the superhero uh, superheroes have left earth you literally have like black adam and the villains who essentially like make their move on Earth. It's the coolest thing. Like, it's, it's one of the coolest things ever because right now protecting Earth, you've got Wonder Woman, Batman, and, and Superman. Literally, Superman is going to focus on Dr. Manhattan. We know that because of Manhattan's vision. Wonder Woman, I guess, is going to be left to defend the Earth by herself because Batman's going to race off as well. It's awesome. Okay, so we are continuing with Doomsday Clock. <laughs> 
<laughs> God, this story's taking like two years to come out. Okay. The cool thing is that the big takeaway from the last issue was basically it was like Dr. Manhattan fighting against the Justice League. It was really more just toying with them. That was the craziest thing about the last issue. Almost all the Earth superheroes come rolling in on Mars to like confront Dr. Manhattan and he's just kind of toying with them and is like, okay, I'm bored now and just waves his hand and they're all incapacitated, right? It was just like this grandiose display of how painfully outmatched they are against someone with the kind of power that Dr. Manhattan has. But the great thing about this story is it picks up with what's essentially classic misdirection, right? Like it picks up with this old, this old film. Uh, this really just referred to as like the adjournment, right? Like the adjournment is, is basically like this film that's being shot with a couple other people, one of which is Carver Cole and for the most part, he's just kind of considered to be inept to a degree, right? Like he's basically an actor that just can't pull it off is, is really what it kind of seems to be hit at here. Like it's, it's taken 12 takes and he keeps forgetting what his line is supposed to be. And the funny thing about this is that again, like with Dr. Manhattan, he does he, he never really, he doesn't see time linearly the same way we do, right? Like we don't know what tomorrow holds. We have to wait until tomorrow gets here to find out, right? It's like that, it's like that rule. You get off work at 7 a.m. and you go to bed and you go to sleep. People will say, well, it's already tomorrow. No, tomorrow starts when I wake up. Like that's the way the world works. And so because of that, with Manhattan seeing everything happening all at the same time, for him, like events that are supposed to happen for us have already happened for him. You know, he just sees them. He just knows how it's going to turn out. And so being able to see time simultaneously means that again, we sort of bounce around here. Now, of course, we'll do this in a way that, that essentially makes sense. But but for Carver Coleman himself, again, he's kind of considered to be like a, a nonsensical actor. And then on top of all that, he's basically being blackmailed. Now, of course, we end up finding out the person that's blackmailing him is his mom. Again, these are just kind of smaller points here and there. In reality, it just kind of sets the stage for the struggle of Carver to kind of show us the nature of his character, what it is that he's going through. He is kind of a centerpiece, but not the definitive centerpiece. Instead, what ends up happening here is when he's blackmailed, uh, blackmailed by his mom, you know, following up with that, he basically gets the, gets like all the, the, the lines and everything down perfectly. So whatever was said between the two of them, the indication is that it's, it has a pretty significant impact on him. And so from there, we basically end up switching over to like Dr. Manhattan himself. And this is cool because what he does is he actually sort of kind of recollects or it really seems to flash back among his own memories, right? Like bringing Laurie, the second sil uh, silk Spectre to Mars and of course she suffocates and he gives her the ability to breathe and so on just kind of like jumping through these small little moments here and there and it's kind of a cool thing because then ultimately it basically settles when he first arrived in the main DC universe on April 18th 1938 now for those people who are familiar with uh, the history of DC comics this date will strike you in particular and the reason why is because this is almost exactly three months before the arrival of Superman right like action comics number one debuted in June of 1938 so this is almost three months exactly before uh, Superman pops up on the scene. And, and again, kind of focus being put here on, on Carver Coleman. This notion that like he's a little kid, that his mom really seems to be like a prostitute more or less, that he gets a job working at a uh, at a picture studio, just working in the mailroom, that eventually like the building burns down after he catches his boss, essentially with another man, which back then was considered to be taboo. And of course he's basically fired. He ends up being homeless. And then he's essentially like, you know, ran up on by some cops who really start beating the crap out of him. And then Dr. Manhattan shows up. And that's when Manhattan begins to basically find his anchor in, in the DC universe. And this is an important thing because when it comes to Manhattan in, in really like the Watchmen universe, he's essentially disconnected from humanity, right? He's just kind of like, I'm bored of people. But with Manhattan leaving the Watchmen universe and then coming over to, to this universe, basically it's him just kind of going through and saying, okay, like I'm exploring the multiverse now, right? Like, I mean, that was the whole thing. Like I just kind of broke into the multiverse to go look at different things. But it's this idea that he's essentially starting over, right? Like he's, it's almost like a, like a, a scientific experiment that's starting over again. He's somewhat invested in it because he wants to learn what all this is about. And that's when he starts speaking with Carver and Carver almost addresses him as like an angel or a god. And so when the two of them sit down, which is actually kind of an interesting power that I didn't really know Manhattan had, he actually refracts light around himself to, to essentially change his appearance so that this woman, this waitress, sees what he wants her to see, which I mean, I guess for a guy that can control the atomic structure of matter, it makes sense. But nonetheless, in his discussions with Carver, what he does is really just kind of give him like these small little bits of information about things that'll happen later on down the line. This is kind of a funny thing here. And the reason why is because we don't initially find out what it is that he told him. All we know is that between the time that Carver basically went to Hollywood to try to become an actor and then ultimately became a paperboy, lost his job, and then got his job in the uh, in the adjournment, that basically like Manhattan spoke to him and talked to him. Now, here's why this matters is because again, Coleman is his anchor to humanity. It's through Coleman that Manhattan begins to sort of understand what people are like in this universe, right? Because there's no assumption it's the same thing. There's no assumption that like that, that, that when they show up here, that, that or at least when he shows up here, that it's going to be the exact same thing as the Watchmen universe. It's an impartial 
just sort of looking at things and seeing how they unfold. But in the midst of all this, suddenly Manhattan is basically like he overhears this conversation about some guy, you know, basically like some guy in Metropolis who picked up a car over his head, the introduction of Superman. And he immediately takes off because from that point, it becomes a question of, okay, so basically I've traveled back to the moment when Superman first pops up and he actually watches the events unfold. He witnesses the events take place. Now, this is kind of a funny thing here because the indication is that when this happens, when Superman picks up his car, he looks back and basically like glances at Manhattan, but he doesn't seem to see Manhattan or if he does that he just kind of smirks or, or what have you. Now, a lot of that kind of goes into the idea that like he had this smile on his face, you know, is what they were saying when he picked up the car. And so it was kind of a cool thing because what Manhattan does is literally start going through and saying, okay, so Superman seems to be where my life ends, right? That's the main brunt of the story so far is that the last thing Manhattan sees is Superman flying at him and, and, you know, absolutely pissed off. And then everything goes black and he doesn't know if it goes black because Superman kills him or if it goes black because he wipes everything out. And so he really just kind of begins to sort of look at the timeline as it was supposed to be, right? And, and this is kind of the cool thing that in the, in, in 1940, that Alan Scott was basically, you know, on a, like a, a railway guy. And then he came across a green lantern, picked it up and used it. And then it basically saved him from this train crash that was going to happen that, that in, uh, in January of around the same year, Jay Garrick falls asleep, you know, and is exposed to, to heavy water and ends up becoming, you know, the, the flash Jay Garrick, the same thing with Carter Hall becoming Hawkman with Al Pratt becoming the Adam Kent Nelson becoming Dr. Fate with, uh, Wesley Dodds becoming Sandman with Jim Corgan becoming, uh, becoming the Spectre, these origins of these characters, you know, as he knows them and as he's seen them unfold. And then it switches over to the formation of the JSA. And this is a cool thing because there's actually a, some history that Jeff Johns pulls out here. So when the JSA meets, what they do is they, they kind of start talking about like their role as characters, you know, what are they going to do as heroes? And for the most part, they're not wildly familiar with each other. They're just kind of aware the other is there. Now, this is kind of a cool thing because what this does is it basically hits it like what's essentially the first crossover between these characters. Now, back in the day, the JSA was, was tried and true. The first real coming together of a singular team, like all-star comics, you know, the idea of a team sort of banding together. Now, the original JSA as it existed back in All-Star Comics number three was actually a team up. And that's one of the reasons why it's so cool is because truthfully, Superman number 76 is what a lot of people point out when they say DC first established their shared universe, but it's kind of, but not really. And the reason why is because all these characters that you see were created by All-Star publications. And then the DC side, or at least the, the Batman Superman side was national allied publications. It was almost kind of like Marvel and DC, so to speak, right? So I mean, like eventually All-Star and National Allied joined together and they became Detective Comics Incorporated, but essentially this was a sister publication. Now the difference is that National Allied and All-American shared characters, right? Like they would, they would go back and forth with characters, but Wonder Woman, uh, uh, Alan Scott, the original Green Lantern, Jay Garrick, the original Flash, the Spectre, these guys, they were all uh, All-Star Comics. And so in reality, it was kind of a shared universe strictly within All-Star Comics. That's why Superman number 76 and the formation of a shared universe in that story, the fact that Gotham and Metropolis both exist on the same earth and that Batman and Superman can cross over with each other. The reason why that was so big is because that was the first time we'd seen that going into what was essentially Detective Comics Incorporated, the merging of National Allied and All-Star Comics. So again, that's that's why that, that little bit of history there is significant. But with this team meeting up and this team basically talking, one of the things they say is we need to find Superman. And this is kind of a cool thing because back then when this, when this was really kind of being launched again, it was for the most part hands off. And while they did share characters and the popularity of Superman and Batman could have essentially carried over to the JSA, the issue was that it wasn't. And the reason why was because they were afraid of overexposure, right? Because you had the Superman comics and you had action. You had the Batman comics and you had Detective. And then not only that, you actually had Superboy that was running around, uh, going on around the same time. Both National Allied and All-Star were afraid that if Superman and Batman appeared in the JSA, in addition to the other publications they had, that people would get burned out on them. But the fact remains that like when they're going through and they're looking at this moment, suddenly everything shifts. And it goes back to when you had Johnny Thunder first starting the picture and saying like, okay, the team's all here. Let's get our picture, guys. No one knows who Superman is. No one knows who he is, where he, where he was, where he's from, or anything like that. Essentially, Superman doesn't seem to exist. And that's kind of the crazy thing is because what he does is Dr. Manhattan travels back to, to essentially where Superman first crash landed in Smallville. And then of course it kind of goes through a little bit of his origin story. Now we don't really have to do this per se because it's the origin story of Superman, right? He's discovered by John and Martha Kent. They raise him, eventually they die. But the thing is, is like John and Martha have died in various ways over the years that they've died when, when like Jonathan just died of old age. They've died when they were killed in a car crash. They died when they both died of old age. Like they've both died under different circumstances. And usually it's the result of a reboot. And that's exactly what Manhattan hits on. When Manhattan goes through all these different stories of Superman and says, okay, well, John died in this circumstance and then Martha died in that circumstance. And then John and Martha both died in this particular circumstance. That what he's basically doing here is he's looking at this and saying, okay, if Superman goes on to become a character that embodies hope, then let's see how far out this goes. And so what he does is he, he jumps all the way to the 31st century, right? Like when Superboy is first brought to that 
era by the Legion of Superheroes. Again, a major arc for Superboy back in the day when he became like this sort of major superhero that dealt with more than just what Superman was doing when he was a kid. And as the Legion begins to talk to him, what we end up having is this scenario where, where Dr. Manhattan says, okay, fine, then let's see what happens if I change things. So he removes the lantern from Alan Scott's grasp. And what it does is it creates this cascading effect. The death of Alan Scott, the fact that he doesn't show up, basically leads to all these various characters not existing. Superman never is never taken to the 31st century as Superboy, meaning that point in time never really seems to happen. Instead, it just kind of flash forwards a little bit. And then it shows like the New 52 origin where John and Martha Kent are basically killed in a car crash. So again, like it's one of these things where Manhattan goes back. He, he, he looks into the future and says, okay, the legacy of Superman lasts well into the 31st century. So let's see what happens if we change things. That what Manhattan does is he looks down and he says, this universe as it exists, this DC universe is singular. It's one of a kind. The human beings on this planet perceive the multiverse as basically like a, a sort of branch universe theory, right? Like what if Superman landed in Russia instead of the United States? Well, then you get Red Sun Superman, but it's a branch off of the existing universe. That's the way it works. But what he says is that this universe is constantly changing. It's constantly in flux. It's not as though this universe came into existence and then it's basically maintained its exact same form ever since it was first created. We've had crisis on infinite earths. We've had infinite crisis. We've had final crisis. We've had zero hour crisis in time. And we've had the events of Flashpoint happen. This universe has constantly changed by one, you know, for one reason or another. And when it did, it shuffled up the timeline. Things suddenly vanished. But that's the question that a lot of people had. People would sit down and they would say, okay, so my question is this, if Crisis on Infinite Earths happened and it was essentially a reboot coming out of Crisis on Infinite Earths, basically there was only a singular universe and everybody gets new origins, then what happened to things before that? They just vanished. They were just gone one day. That was it. The original origin story of the JSA as it existed in 1940 in All-Star Comics number three was wiped away. What you got was the version of the JSA post-crisis that originally appeared, where they were basically heroes that fought during World War II. That's the nature of what's kind of going on here, is it's this idea that like all these other universes that exist out there, they do branch off this universe. But the reason why they branch off is because the main DC universe is changing all the time. It's constantly in flux. And that's what Manhattan looks and that's why he did his experiment is because he said, I look at this, the history of this universe and I see the Flash Barry Allen who initiated the Flashpoint. I see like the Anti-Monitor. I see Extant. I see all these things ranging from the original Crisis to Zero Hour all the way running up until, you know, the events of Flashpoint. And I see all these major changes that take place. So if they can mess up the timeline, then so can I. I'm just going to use it as a grand experiment and just see what happens. It's a kid with an ant farm is basically what this is. Now, the funny thing is he says, like, there are a couple instances when, like, the universe tried to fight back, right? So, like, Wally West realized what was going on and tried to break out of the Speed Force to basically confront Manhattan and was forced back into it again. And that goes into the events of DC Universe Rebirth number one, when Barry remembers who he is and essentially brings him back. But the cool thing about that is that when that happens, a lot of Wally's memories were kind of thrown into flux or wiped away entirely. He doesn't remember any of it. And that's kind of the crazy thing here is because when he looks at this, he kind of looks at humanity. And again, he looks at Carver Coleman and he says, like, you're going to die. We end up finding out he was basically killed by his mom using an award that he won but dr manhattan again kind of returns back to his disconnect it's kind of like okay so basically it's still pretty much the same thing here like and this universe is the same thing as the other sure they have like super powered beings but at the end of the day it's all still basically the same thing it's humans running around with these irrelevant problems that they think are super important but they're not because they don't really see the grand scheme of things and their problems are no more important than the problems of anybody else but they think it's the most significant thing in the world because they believe the world revolves around them and that's kind of the cool thing here that's what's so awesome about that is he basically sits down and he says in this universe that I live in with these experiments that I've done with the way that I've toyed with things the way that I've screwed things up and messed with these people's lives in this universe of hope that literally revolves around Superman I've essentially become the villain and it's kind of a cool thing he doesn't say it because he really thinks he's a bad guy it's really just kind of like this internal discussion that he has I'm basically the villain here I'm basically the bad guy I've literally been screwing up the time stream it's focusing on the nature of Manhattan why has he done what he's done because he came into this universe he realized that like this universe is special in the sense that every other universe in the multiverse branches off of it and, and that the universe is constantly changing. So the question is, what happens if you change things too fast? What happens if you change things in the extreme? What will happen with this universe? It's a science project is basically what it is. So again, the question is still, still lingering. Does Dr. Manhattan destroy this universe or does Superman destroy Dr. Manhattan? That's the question. Okay, so we are getting into Doomsday Clock. Thank God the newest issue of Doomsday Clock came out. I honestly didn't even know if it was going to happen. Like, dude, this, this story has been so delayed. It's absolutely crazy. But 
it is really good and it, and it really is kind of worth it. It's pretty amazing. Like we finally get answers here, right? Which is kind of the issue, right? Jeff Johns is great at writing, but sometimes he stretches things on a bit too long. <laughs> Especially when it takes a story like three years to finish, then it's just like, all right, dude, just release it all as like a one shot. Like just release the rest of it as like just one trade or something like that. Just like one single story. Anyway, so what we have going on here in this world right now on in, in the DC universe, which remember, this is in continuity. This is taking place. I mean, before all the stuff that's going on right now, but basically it, it takes place in the main DC line of comics. You essentially have the world falling apart, right? Because the world has learned about the Superman conspiracy, where at least the Superman conspiracy has taken hold in the world. And then of course you had the explosion of Ronnie Raymond in, in Moscow, Russia, and then you had the superheroes taking off to Mars. So to get you guys caught up on those of you guys who aren't really, uh, aren't, who aren't really familiar with this, first things first, go watch all the other videos that we've done. And the second thing is to do kind of a, a, a rundown, like a quick little explanation here. The Superman conspiracy is this idea that floats around that that after Superman arrived in the world, right? Like after he basically popped up and became Superman, he left Smallville, went to Metropolis and became Superman, that what the United States started doing was basically creating metahumans of their own that could either be a counter to Superman or could fight alongside Superman, right? It was basically the United States government's attempt to kind of maintain control of the country. Now, following that, you have the events in Moscow. And the idea behind this was that somewhere along the line, uh, Ronnie Raymond and company ended up in, in uh, Moscow, Russia. Now, how all that ties together, we'll actually find out later in the story but basically ronnie raymond ended up in in moscow russia and during a major conflict he essentially detonated and when that happened it basically killed a multitude of different people essentially turning them to glass and then people saw it as an attack by american metahumans on russian soil and so that basically led to russians attempting to retaliate against the united states now following this you had all the superheroes or at least all the the major superheroes from the u.s who went to mars now they were following the trail of breadcrumbs which led them to believe that dr manhattan was on mars albeit they didn't know who he was they just knew there was a being out there and they had basically hypothesized that he was the one responsible for all of this. The problem was when they went to go face off against Dr. Manhattan, he toyed with them for about 30 seconds and then took them all out. And that was basically it, right? So pretty much all the superheroes in the United States, except for Wonder Woman, Superman, and Batman are basically gone. Like, I mean, they're not dead, but they're essentially unconscious on Mars. Now, because of that, what it does is it picks up with the fact that the earth is basically devolved into total chaos, right? Like what you're seeing right now is essentially the way that Adrian Veidt's world in the Watchmen universe universe had essentially gone its way, right? I mean, Adrian Veidt basically released this giant monster into the world, and with all the death and all the destruction, it united humanity. And then following that, people eventually figured out that Adrian Veidt was the one behind it, that it was all one big ruse, and humanity actually devolved to a state worse than before, and then ultimately it ended with the Watchmen universe being engulfed in nuclear war, basically wiping out all life on Earth, or at least we can just kind of assume that was the case since, you know, it was nuclear war. It was it was mutually assured destruction, right? It was mad. So because of that, this really kind of seems to be going the same way, right? Like, things kind of seem to be devolving in the same process. You've got a litany of conflicts taking place, right? Like you've got Giganta facing off against Wonder Woman, and then suddenly she's met by the arrival of Black Adam. Now, this is when we end up finding out here that in Black Adam's country of Kandak, because of the fact that he's so isolationist, he's almost kind of taken this Magneto approach. Now, uh, really, Black Adam has done this a litany of times over the years, right? Like, I mean, you really saw it a lot in the Injustice stories, but basically what, what Black Adam has done here is he has isolated Kandak and said, this is a safe haven for metahumans. All the metahumans who were left on Earth, who are not part of like the top tier superheroes, they can all come to Kondok and they can basically find like refuge. Now it does allow the various metahumans to leave, but the big focus that the United States has at the moment, that is to say the American people and even people in Russia and in some other countries across the world is that the United States needs to hand over Superman. And the reason why is because Vladimir Putin has issued a deadline, right? He said at midnight, if Superman is not handed over to the Russian government, we launch an attack because right now the United States has no real superheroes, but Russia does. Russia has all their various superhero forces. And so invading the United States, would actually go off pretty much without a, without a hitch. And so again, like everything is kind of falling to pieces because when all that happens, you end up having Superman, of course, who awakes, you know, following, you know, his incident and, and collapsing and all that kind of stuff. You've got Superman who basically wakes up into, you know, with this, I guess a little break having been taken with everything kind of going to pieces with everything going to pot. And it's kind of a crazy scenario because as that happens, you end up finding out that essentially that Adrian Veidt is talking to somebody that we can't really see watching these things unfold and these makeshift monitors and everything sort of going to pieces, you know, but then of course we end up finding out that Adrian Veidt is actually an Arkham Asylum. And the way this whole thing plays out, or at least it seems like he's an Arkham Asylum, but the way all this plays out is he walks by one room, tells this old man to be quiet. And then he basically ends up running up on Saturn Girl. Now remember, Saturn Girl was part of the Legion of Superheroes from the 30th 
20th century. I think Bendis changed it to the 31st century, but she's part of the Legion of Superheroes from the future and she can read minds. The issue is that when she came back here, presumably she came back here to warn of like a major event that was going to happen, right? That's what Adrian Veidt says. Like you came here to warn Superman of something that you couldn't possibly understand, right? But the issue is that somewhere along the line, she was basically captured and she was thrown in Arkham Asylum at one point. Uh, we don't know exactly where she is right now, but like she was essentially captured and wasn't able to warn Superman. Now, because of that, we end up switching over to Lex Luthor. Now, this is one of the most important parts of the story, right? Because Lex Luthor has been working with Lois Lane to kind of give these little bits and pieces of information in terms of what seems to truly be going on here. And what Lex Luthor says is that at some point along the line that he found a photograph. Now we know that this photograph is of John, right? It's of Dr. Manhattan back, with, back when he was human on the Watchmen universe. But this, this photo was brought with Dr. Manhattan over to the main DC universe when he arrived and the picture was discovered. The issue with this is that multitudes of these pictures have been discovered, right? It would be simple if it was just one, because what that means is that Dr. Manhattan brought the picture with him. And then when he showed up in the main DC universe at whatever time frame, then the picture was basically dropped, right? By accident or whatever the case may have been, he left it there. And that basically has kind of just been floating there ever since. The issue is that all these pictures are showing up here, right? They're showing up at different points in time in the DC universe. Now, really what Jeff Johns does is kind of give us a hint. He won't full on explain this until the end, but it kind of gives us a hint, right? Like the big moment is back in on April 18th in 1938. Now, the reason why I say this was a, this is a hint is because for those of you guys who are familiar with your DC history, that's when Action Comics number one was published. In the chronological timeline of DC, including all the various crises and everything they've had, that's when Clark Kent officially like came out as Superman, right? Like that was his first major act as Superman. So that was a huge moment in the history of things. You go forward and you end up finding each one of these things has appeared at various points in time. Now, the question seemed to be, at least from, from Lois Lane's stance, does this mean that like whoever's doing this is traveling through time? Now, those of you guys who are familiar with Dr. Manhattan know, that's not the case. Dr. Manhattan does not time travel, right? He can't jump from the future to the past. Dr. Manhattan sees all time as a singular moment, right? So like he's standing in like 2019, right? And he's just kind of staring vaguely out into space. That's because he's seeing all points in time simultaneously. So he really kind of knows where things are going to be, but he has, doesn't actually go to the future. He still moves forward in time, just like everybody else does, but he's not from this universe. So again, like this is him popping up here. And so Lex Luthor actually has his own theory in terms of how it is that a man that cannot time travel travel somehow appears at different points in time with the same picture, right? Because by all standards of measurement, what this looks like is it looks like Dr. Manhattan showed up on April 13th in 1938 in the main DC universe when Superman first popped up and then seemed to drop the picture or forget about it or whatever, and then left, maybe went to a different universe or something like that, then came back. But it's almost like he basically went back to the past and then came to the future and then went back to the past and then came to a different point in the future and then rinse repeat, right? But we know that's not the case because Manhattan doesn't time travel. And so it's cool because we end up getting this really, really good explanation from Jeff Johns towards the end of this in terms of how all that goes down. And so really like following this, you end up picking up with Reginald Long. Now, of course, again, Reginald Long was the, the son of Malcolm Long and the guy who's essentially the new Rorschach here. And while he's being held in prison, he starts experiencing these crazy visions, right? These visions of his father going in to basically speak with Walter Corvax that he's trying to plead with him. Hey, look, don't do that. Don't be that guy who does that. It's only going to destroy you. Uh, end up meeting with like Johnny Thunder. Now, of course, that happened at some point before and Johnny Thunder basically sacrificed his life, right? He died. He just kind of burned alive. But then you basically end up seeing that, that he's actually speaking, or at least you kind of have this appearance of Alfred Pennyworth. Now, this is kind of a subtle thing, but it's also an exceedingly important thing. And the reason why is because it's very, very short and it doesn't seem to be important, but this basically solidifies the fact that Batman has not given up on Rorschach. Remember, Batman was the one that grabbed him. Batman was the one that took him and basically tossed him in the slammer. And he's kind of been there ever since. But what it means is that Batman didn't throw him in the slammer and then just walk away and forget about it. The Batman had a backup plan. The backup plan was Alfred, do your homework, go through here and look at everything about Reginald Long. Read the whole diary of Rorschach, the whole nine yards. Learn everything you possibly can, given the circumstances, right? Because the guy's from a different universe, so he doesn't really have a life on this on this main DC universe. But learn everything you can and, and see if what he says is true. Of course, because Batman had everything else going on, didn't really have time for it. And that's what Alfred's been doing. Alfred's been doing research, he's been poking around, and he basically learned that everything that Reginald Long said is true, right? Like everything that he's claimed about his life, about Rorschach, the man, you know, Walter Korvax being Rorschach before him, that all of that is true. He's not just a crazy guy. But the issue is that where you end up having Alfred Pennyworth try and decide with him, all that you really have, or at least all that, that, that Reggie really knows at this point is betrayal, right? That's really all he knows about his life is betrayal. Losing his father, Ozymandias turning against him, Batman throwing him in the slammer. That's all he really knows. And so of course he ends up bailing on Alfred Pennyworth and taking off, you know, and that's when things really sort of just kind of vanish. And because what this does is it switches over to the answer, or to, an, to an answer to the question that a lot of people have been wondering about Doomsday Clock. 
clock. Since the beginning of Doomsday Clock, one of the questions a lot of people have had is, where's Sally Jaspezic, whatever her name is, like Sally Jupiter basically, and like Night Owl 2, where are those characters at? And we actually get an answer here. So if you recall the characters from the previous video, Marionette and Mime, who were basically just criminals, right? They were just street level criminals that at some point in their past when they were committing a robbery, that Dr. Manhattan was going to kill them, but then chose not to because of the fact that Marionette was pregnant. Now, what Ozymandias says here is that when this went down, everybody believed that Dr. Manhattan didn't kill Marionette because of the fact that she was pregnant. But then he started thinking, literally Dr. Manhattan stood there and watched the comedian kill a pregnant woman. So like, he doesn't really care about the, the notion of pregnancy, like the significance of it or anything like that. It's just a human he doesn't really care anything about, who was also housing a smaller human who doesn't really, he doesn't really care anything about. So the question was, why did he save Marionette? And the reason why is because at some point along the line, Marionette would give birth to their daughter and then either they would die or they would end up in jail or she would have to give it up or whatever the case is, but the child would be handed over to Sally Jaspezic and to Dan Dryberg, who have basically adopted the monikers of Hollis. Now, that was a that was a, a very end of the Watchmen, that was part of the Watchmen story, but essentially like they adopted new identities and then went forward as wholly new people. Now, the downside of this is we can largely assume that they basically died in the Watchmen universe, right? When the world was engulfed in nuclear war, that was basically the end of it. But that's what ends up happening here with, with Ozymandias, is he basically starts to break down all this bit of a story, starts to explain all these different things. And what he says, here is that on his world that it all basically engulfed he was trying to find a way to unite it right and then he was trying to find a way to save his world once everybody realized that he was basically pulling a ruse and he, he's the one who released the monster that humanity didn't actually unite itself because of some genuine threat from a different dimension or from outer space or however they wanted to interpret it instead like they were all manipulated by ozymandias and so as a result of this what he wanted to do was basically save his world which was rapidly devolving in a nuclear war which we can largely assume by now is it's already too late for it and at the same time like try to find a way to save this world which would ultimately end up devolving into the same landscape and so what he did is he manipulated this world in order to save it that when he went out and when he started poking around and he started looking around what he ended up discovering is that one when he grabbed this ship and when he stowed away and then he jumped from his universe to this universe that as he started going around and looking around he discovered of course superheroes he discovered like the flash and wonder woman and batman and shazam and all these characters which seemed exceedingly impossible right i mean it is a different universe from his own and so if the dc if dc comics can have a universe where anthropomorphic animals including captain Carrot. Captain Carrot. I love Captain Carrot. Captain Carrot is a super bunny. If you can have a, a universe <laughs> that basically has anthropomorphic animals playing the role of superheroes, then you can have a universe where you have humans who are superheroes, right? Like an infinite number of universes for an infinite number of possibilities, which seemingly only 52 have actually been discovered according to Grant Morrison's uh, multiversity. And so because of that, what he did is he said, okay, fine, there's a way to manipulate everything. There's a way to basically get Manhattan to come back. And so what he did here is seemingly in the blink of an eye, he engineered this plan that when he started looking around, he learned that the Superman conspiracy actually had merit. That while it wasn't, a, like not every single metahuman in the United States is a result of government experimentation, some of them are. Under Martin Stein, basically the guy who would go on to merge with Ronnie Raymond and become Firestorm, that under Martin Stein, all these projects were seen, they were overseen, and they were basically designed to create metahumans that could either counter Superman or fight along and monitor Superman, right? It was basically the US government never fully trusted the Man of Steel. And so they wanted to have at least some kind of deterrent, right? A super Superman was basically a really, really cool guy. And then Lois Lane broke his heart and he said, you know what? The heck with humanity, right? Like he followed the red pill and just became this really angry guy. And then basically like tried to wipe away the world. Then they would have a way to counter that, right? And so because of that, what he did is he said, okay, then let's take this Superman conspiracy and let's leak it to a guy named, named, uh, named Pozar, uh, out in, in Russia, right? So then Russia gets a hold of the Superman conspiracy before the U.S. does. And then Russia starts espousing it. And so that's why you ended up having this initial rift in the United States, because Russia was saying that the United States is creating all these various super heroes in response to Superman, that the Superman conspiracy is real. And the American people initially rejected it, right? Well, this is just Russians using misinformation and just doing what they do. But then detailed information started to leak out. And as that information started to leak out, humanity began to believe it. And as they started to believe it, they started to turn against Superman. Following this, Ozymandias engineered the explosion of a firestorm in Russia, which further seemed to lead to the idea that if the United States government is engineering superheroes for the purpose of doing whatever it is that they want to do, and then Russia called them on it, Russia Russia leaked that information, this is the US government retaliating against Russia, or it's the superheroes retaliating against Russia, whatever the case is, it looks like it's the United States acting in a defensive manner because what Russia said was true. And so it further solidified the Superman conspiracy and then further solidified people turning against Superman and the various members of the superhero community. And so when all this is basically explained, we end up having this really, really cool exchange that takes place between one, Superman and Black Adam, as well as Ozymandias and Jupiter Girl, not Jupiter Girl, Saturn Girl. <laughs> 
<laughs> against Mars girl. Uh, so the way this plays out, of course, is you basically have like Black Adam and his forces which show up on the White House lawn, right? Which never bodes well. Like any time that, that Black Adam shows up, it usually means somebody's gonna get the crap beat out of him, right? It's usually the way it is. So you end up having this kind of exchange here, right? Now, Superman shows up because regardless of what the world thinks of him, Superman will continue to protect the world. Now, that's the nature of his character. It's the way he's always been written. That Superman's role, his, his loyalty is not to like a singular government. Superman is not loyal to the US government any more so than he would be loyal to the Russian government or anything like that. If it's something that would endanger people, like he'll side with the government if they need him to do something that would basically like stop some, some catastrophic threat, right? Like the US government comes to him and says, Superman, there is a meteor coming to earth and it's gonna destroy all life on earth. We need you to work alongside the suicide squad and stop it. Okay, then like he would do that. But like, he's not a government stooge. This is not like the Dark Knight Returns where he just does what the government tells him to. Instead, it's basically one of these things where he's an ally of earth. And having having like Black Adam show up on the White House lawn to confront the president is basically a scenario that goes with Superman saying somebody has to act. But this is the problem with the Superman conspiracy, right? You know, in, in this day and age, it's, you know, people choose the facts they want, right? Like people believe what they want to believe. And so because of that, people would look at that and they would say, well, it's not really Superman standing and like protecting the president. It's Superman protecting the government because he's a government stooge because of the Superman conspiracy, because, you know, I, I believe it's true. I want it to be true. So I'm going to assume it's true. And, and it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's really kind of a social critique, right? It's a critique of modern society, right? Like people replace facts with their opinions and then treat their opinions as fact. And so it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, in terms of how this unfolds, but you end up having Ozymandias who basically asks this question to Saturn girl. He says, here's the question that I have for you. If you come from the future of this timeline and in the future of this timeline, a massive event takes place and you've come to warn Superman because because of it, here's my question: Does Superman remember you? Right? Like, does he? Does he? Like, in the in in whatever this future is, does Superman remember you? And the response to that question is no. And so basically, she starts to vaporize because what what Osmanius basically says is, you come from a timeline that doesn't exist anymore. Right? You come from a timeline that's not there anymore. This feeds into what Doctor Manhattan had basically discovered is that by virtue of his actions, the Legion of Superheroes don't exist. Right? The Legion of Superheroes cease to exist because of something that it is that he's done. And so as you end up having Osmanius passing by this this cell with this old man, we end up learning this old man is actually Alan Scott. He's the Green Lantern, which is a crazy revelation. <laughs> <laughs> that seemingly Alan Scott seems to be still alive. Like, I don't, I don't really know how. As far as I'm aware, he's dead. That what ended up happening is 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 in one of the earlier Doomsday Clock stories, that Dr. Manhattan had actually moved the lantern away from Alan Scott so that when the lantern landed, Alan Scott didn't see it and was hit by the train. Instead of in the original comic, when he saw the lantern crash and then he went to go grab the lantern and because he grabbed it, he ended, he wasn't hit by the train, right? He missed the train. And so because of that, like, it's it's kind of a crazy little, a little facet here because you end up having Manhattan watching this whole scenario on fold with Superman fighting against Black Adam. And he says like in six seconds, Superman is going to see me. Five, four, three, two, one. Superman meets Dr. Manhattan. It is here, ladies and gentlemen. It is here, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. The conclusion of Doomsday Clock. Man, we've all been vying for this. <laughs> Only took three years to finish. Okay, so if you guys remember, uh, in the in the basically everything that's been going on over the course of the last eleven issues for for Doomsday Clock has essentially been that like that there were a couple things going on, and really like two major events, right? It was the idea that Jeff Johns was building the scenario where the world was essentially coming to an end, not really by like nuclear war or anything like that, really more by like a metahuman war that was kind of building up. This idea that all the metahumans across the world were going to go to war, and it was going to kind of be DC's equivalent of like the Watchmen's end of the world, right? Where in the Watchmen universe, it was basically just a collapse, you know, of the world, basically by way of like nuclear warfare, where that seemed to be the case. Instead, what we basically had here is we had two things happen. The first was the, was the Superman conspiracy, this idea that essentially all the metahumans or most of them uh, of the world's metahumans had resulted from experiments in the United States uh, based on the work of, uh, well, really people didn't actually know where it was from. It was just that like Superman had arrived on Earth and, and arrived in Kansas at some point along the line after he showed up. Up, the federal government started experimenting with creating metahumans, and that's where most of them came from. The next big thing to really follow that was the whole incident that happened in Russia with Firestorm, with Rodney Raymond, where basically his energy was let out in an extreme capacity, and the result was that uh, multiple people in, in Russia were killed. I think it was in Moscow itself, but multiple people in Russia were killed. And so what this meant was that the world was basically on the brink of collapse, right? You know, with the Superman conspiracy and all the things tied into it, the idea that the United States was basically uh, mass producing metahumans had really seemed to push the world, you know, closer closer towards its destruction, that, that the idea of the 
the incident in Russia had really kind of been the powder keg that set it all off. Now, the reality was that Earth's superheroes had, for the most part, learned to a degree what was going on, insofar as it all seemed to stem from Manhattan, which of course led to the battle in, on Mars, and then Manhattan himself had basically defeated pretty much all of them, and then showed up on Earth to find out why he couldn't see past Superman. You know, when, when he and Superman were going to fight, why he couldn't see past him. And that's where this basically picks up. This idea that, like, he cannot see what's supposed to happen here. He can't see past Superman. Now, it's the crazy thing, because Superman basically just approaches him, right? That's what we left off in the last video, is that Superman was walking up to Dr. Manhattan, right? And it's interesting, because Manhattan's response here is, you're the one who's going to destroy me, or I'm the one who's going to destroy uh, destroy everything. I don't really know which way it is, but essentially, everything's going to end, right? Like, everything ends. And that's kind of the cool thing here, is it's because of, it's really Superman who doesn't even really understand what's going on here, right? Like, Superman's just kind of like, okay, so I don't I don't know who you are, I don't know where you where you came from, but, like, you're literally telling me on the, on the cusp of this major collapse, and all these various superpowered beings running towards me, wanting to fight me, like, you're telling me that, like, the world's going to end, or you're going to kill me, or I'm going to kill you, or whatever the case is, like, I'll deal with that here in a minute. <laughs> That's basically it. Like, I'll deal with that here in a minute. And this is kind of the funny thing, right? Because Manhattan is essentially watching all of this unfold. And and under normal circumstances, and given the nature of the Watchmen universe, right? When you looked at characters like the comedian, when you looked at characters like Warshak, you looked at uh, really like Night Owl, Dan Dryberg, and, and all these different things, normally this would have just been a fight that broke out, right? So Superman would have just started attacking everybody because it's what Manhattan is used to seeing. And there is everything that he's seen in the DC universe since he's been here, but this is really more of him just kind of experimenting with the universe and it just sort of of seeing what happens but for the most part you kind of see a darker tone you know really more recently with everything that's gone on and so watching this whole thing unfold with superman what you would end up getting here is a guy who's basically not like going through and trying to kill everyone you see a guy who's trying to fend off and trying to defend himself against everyone making these statements and making these claims there's innocent people here why are you attacking me in this place right so it's interesting because what it does from there is it switches over to reggie now remember when it came to to the character of reggie he basically picked up the mantle of warshak after after Walter Kovacs had basically died. But remember, that's one of the things that was kind of revealed here is for Reggie, it was all built on a lie. That that where Mothman, who had previously died, where Mothman had looked at this and, and he had basically told Reggie that the idea was that his father was really like getting into getting through to Corvax and like helping Corvax become a better person. The reality is that Corvax was warping the mind of Reggie's father. It was the other way around. And so Mothman had essentially lied. But the reason why and the reason for this is is really kind of a, a breakdown of Reggie himself because he's approached by some guy who basically thinks that who really seems like a racist dick and thinks that Reggie's like going to break into his place. And then of course, like you basically have Alfred Pennyworth who shows up and basically rescues Reggie and then starts talking to him. And Reggie has kind of been having this mental crisis because nothing he believed to be true was actually true. Instead, like his father was screwed up by Walter Corvax. He's been wearing the mask of a man who basically killed his father, right? I mean, that was the idea it was not really in a literal sense. It wasn't like, you know, Rorschach killed the father of Reggie, but he certainly drove him to that position, you know? And so as a result of that, what you end up having here is, is you end up having Reggie just kind of being like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to have anything to do with this. And, and ultimately, Alfred really seems to try to talk some sense into him, right? Really kind of seems to be like, Superman needs your help. Like other people out here need your help. There's a greater purpose that can be served here. But ultimately, Reggie doesn't seem to want to listen. Instead, what you get is this continued, you know, claim, this continued uh, scenario with Reggie where it's like, Warshak is a bad guy. I'm wearing the mask of a, of a villain, like of a terrible person, that kind of thing. And then Batman arrives. And this is one of the coolest things, right? Because you would expect Batman to play a much bigger role in Doomsday Clock really in the latter half of the story in the third act than what we've seen so far. But him showing up here and him talking to Walter Kovacs is an amazing thing because you have a lot of other things going on in the background, right? You got like Mime and Marionette who are out doing their thing and so on and so forth and just kind of being crazy and... and doing whatever crazy people do. <laughs> but Batman starts to talk reason into Reggie. And this is probably Batman's most powerful asset, the ability to look at things objectively to remove emotion from the equation and just say like, here's the circumstance for what it is. And one of the, this is one of the most beautiful things here. What he does is he tells Reggie, yes, your perception of Rorschach is not what you thought it was. Your perception of Rorschach was that he was a guy who was basically trying to save the world or doing however, doing whatever it was that you thought it was that he was doing, or rather that you thought he was doing. But in reality, he was the guy who basically turned your father into the worst version of himself, right? Like, he's the one that basically warped and screwed up the mind of your father. And while that is the case, Mothman didn't lie to you, right? Byron didn't lie to you because he wanted to somehow trick you or deceive you or anything like that. He lied to you because he wanted you to take the mask of Warshak and turn it into something better. Turn it into something that means something, that can benefit the world, something that can become much greater. Now, here's the irony of all this, is that while Walter Kovacs himself was pretty screwed up, right? I mean, he was pretty messed up. He was like Batman in the extreme, right? 
so like that that and punisher insofar as walter had no problem with killing people or anything like that like while that was the case at the end of the day walter corvax was the guy who actually stood against adrian veidt and was like you can't kill that many people like you can't be the person that does that even if it does bring peace to the world i can't stand idly by and let you do that so in reality walter corvax actually fought on behalf of humanity in his whole debate and argument with uh with with adrian veidt in the watchman comic which ultimately led to his demise it was a cool moment there but at the end of the day you know it's one of these things where walter was not really as twisted and, and terrible as reggie believed he was it was just reggie's perception of him that's kind of the irony of it all but in the end batman's response is become something better right you see you see a monster when you look at the mask make the mask something to where you look at it and you see a hero and that's kind of the cool thing because then what it does is it switches back to superman and it switches back to dr manhattan and this is awesome here because you know literally you have like like manhattan just sort of talking to him and remember manhattan's just kind of disconnected right he's just kind of like a thing is happening here right he's not like overly emotional about it he's just kind of like you know like like what's going to happen here are you going to destroy me am i going to defend myself like what's going to happen and superman comes lunging at dr manhattan right just comes flying at dr manhattan and that's the crazy thing about this is it doesn't really seem to be provoked right manhattan's just not he's not like your mama wears combat boots and superman is just like you son of a just comes flying at him it doesn't happen that way right it's just superman just starts lunging at dr manhattan and the reason why he does that is to protect manhattan and that is the single most important thing because manhattan looks at everything that's happened basically everything that's 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 taken place in the dc universe so far is really a result of several different actions of dr manhattan right moving the green lantern away from alan scott so that he basically ends up dying uh you know dying in the in the train crash as opposed to becoming the green lantern and preventing the, the train crash uh, and then uh, you know from that point going forward creating the justice society of america like like all these things like the entire existence of the dc universe as it stands now results from like various actions that manhattan had committed the flash point event the fact that he stepped in the idea that he stepped in was the one who's basically saved superman's father uh from the destruction of krypton bringing him into the modern era all these things that are going on are the result of dr manhattan's actions and so what he does is he kind of looks at superman and he expects him to attack him because pretty much the life of superman as it used to be before the events of flashpoint versus the life of superman as it exists now is the result of manhattan meddling Manha or manhattan's actions are the reason why superman's parents are dead different things like that and so he would expect superman to attack him but instead what he ends up getting from superman is he basically like superman doesn't really just fly off the handle that way and that's the way superman usually is and it's the one thing about him that manhattan doesn't really understand because manhattan doesn't really care about people anymore and so when you don't really have an interest in humanity and you don't really care about why people do what they do and your your really major driving force is let's just see what kind of things can happen if i mess with them with the multiverse and that's basically it and then suddenly it becomes shocking when a person's who a person whose life you screwed up really seems to kind of forgive you and really wants to understand why you did what you did as opposed to just losing their mind and trying to kill you and that's really what goes on is because superman starts asking questions who's the woman in the photograph you're leaving that photograph with every step you take everywhere you go was she important to you and of course she was that was jamie that was the girlfriend of dr manhattan when he was younger that was the person whose watch was left in the intrinsic field generator he went running back in there got locked in and then became manhattan right i mean that's that's the nature of his origin is it all has to do with watches and everything and so ultimately because of everything that's going on here this is where things get crazy because with everything going on here superman starts starts talking to him and says well maybe maybe the darkness that you see here maybe it takes everything that you have to save the world right like maybe that's maybe that's the nature of you and so as a result of that Manhattan sits down and he says okay yes I understand now everything ends lifts his hands and it all goes black everything ends up just like vanishing and here's the question to ask here right because what he says what well, the way this narrative goes from manhattan is he says it all begins with a child right it begins with superman all right the metaverse forms around this one and only person everything that takes place the entire all everything that happens in the dc universe all revolves around superman superman comes flying in he crash lands on earth and then in turn what ends up happening is manhattan goes back and basically starts to undo the various things that he did that when alan scott died during the train crash as a result of Manhattan moving the lantern, Manhattan moves the lantern back. And so Alan Scott discovers the lantern, becomes a Green Lantern, saves the day. And so where previously the origin of Superman was, there were no superheroes before him. And, he, and his father literally tells him, the world's not ready for a person like you because they've never seen a person like you before. With the lantern being moved back, with Alan Scott basically becoming the Green Lantern like he was supposed to be, then suddenly the origin of Jonathan, or the, the scenario with Jonathan Kent shifts. And it says, the world has seen people like this before. So if you really believe that you... That 
that your powers give you something to offer the world. And if you really believe that you can become something special and something great, then just get out there and do your thing, son. And the result of this is that where Clark had not really stepped into the role of embracing his powers, uh, you know, during the universe or during the time when Alan Scott never became the Green Lantern, his parents died in a car wreck. But in this instance, because of the fact that he did embrace his powers, because he, his father gave him words of encouragement instead of words of discouragement, when the time came where they were supposed to die in a car crash, Clark Kent's there and he saves him. He saves the lives of John and, uh, John and Martha Kent. So it's that cascading effect, right? The actions of Manhattan when he came in and removed the lantern and Alan Scott died resulted in Alan Scott never becoming the Green Lantern, meaning Superman was never inspired to become Superman, meaning his parents died in a car wreck because his father had discouraged him instead of encouraging him. And of course, things transpired accordingly. But with Alan Scott becoming the Green Lantern, now what this shows is that a singular action could have this massive cascading effect along this great big huge timeline over and over and over again. And that's the crazy thing about it is because Superman now basically becomes Superboy, who in turn steps in and the Legion of Superheroes, of course, travels back in time, recruits Superboy. All these things basically begin to unfold with regards to Superman's impact on the greater landscape. Johnny Thunder, who had long since been searching for his genie, but for, but actually forgotten about it, is basically inspired to return to it. And so Johnny Thunder goes back to being Johnny Thunder the way he was before. Saturn Girl jumps back to the 31st century. Everything starts snapping back in place the way it was supposed to. Basically, what this looks like is going on. And this is where things get, this is where things get kind of crazy. What it looks like it's going on here. I'm not going to claim this, but what it looks like Jeff Johns is doing is resetting the entire timeline, right? Basically, it's not even really a crisis. It kind of feels like a soft reboot. And the reason why I say that is because in the midst of this conflict where Superman is getting pummeled by all these various super powered people, right? Black Adam and all these various individuals, you know, then like literally out of nowhere, it's like you, you remember us now, don't you, right? Because now they're a part of the timeline, right? Superman didn't remember them before because they never existed before, right? The, the, the Legion of Superheroes never came back from the 31st century because Superman was never Superboy. So there was no reason for the Legion of Superheroes to come back. And seemingly they didn't, they didn't really seem to exist because they weren't inspired by Superboy who was brought to the 31st century at some point in time. Like literally because Alan Scott's there, because the Justice Society was created, because Super Superboy, or I guess Clark was inspired to become Superboy and embrace his powers because of this great big huge change in the cascading effect really in the, the timeline itself, suddenly all these heroes start popping up and one of them Mm, one of them says, sorry we're late, son. And ultimately Superman says, well, it's better late than never. And what we get is the return of the Justice, like the, the Justice Society of America and the Legion of Superheroes. Like all these characters are back. Like they're back now in DC Comics. And that's crazy. It's amazing to see like, like basically what we're getting is pretty much what looks like the DC landscape before, like, like at least in terms of heroes, before the events of the New 52. All the characters are back now. The Justice Society of America is back. The Legion of Superheroes is back. And everybody remembers who the other person is. And it's awesome to see, or at least Superman does. And the question is like, will other people like the Flash remember who they are? But essentially Superman has this colossal group of teammates fighting on his behalf. Not only that, what Dr. Manhattan does is witness and really begin to understand that everything really does revolve around Superman. That all these different universes exist out there, and in every single universe, Superman always comes into existence, right? So, you know, during the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, the entire multiverse was reset basically down to a singular universe. There was just Superman. Everything always revolves around Superman. Now, here's one of the craziest things to consider here. The line of DC Comics that we saw between DC Showcase issue number four, when Barry Allen first showed up as a Flash, leading up to the destruction of the multiverse in, in Crisis on Infinite Earths, that's not that's no longer referred to as Earth-1 as it was back then. Instead, now, it's called Earth-1985. And, like, it's a universe out there, right? Like, it's a universe that exists out there and has never been explored, right? It even says that, you know, a, a world unexplored even today, right? He goes as far as, and this, this is where things get crazy, he goes as far as to say that there's a universe out there that exists, right? Like, Earth-52 is out there. Essentially, essentially, like, the new 52 universe exists out there as a separate universe. Jeff Johns is going through and, one, either picking and choosing the various universes from Convergence and kind of keeping them there, building on what we already know in terms of like what universes are there, but basically saying that like there's all these alternate realities out there now. I would not be surprised if in the aftermath of this, we got something akin to like zero hour crisis in time, but for the multiverse, right? Like after zero hour back in the nineties, they kind of gave us like, you know, Marvel gave us this big, I'm sorry, DC gave us this big timeline of like when things happen in the universe, right? Like when Superman arrived on earth, when Batman was born, different things like that. It didn't last, nobody really stuck to it, but I wouldn't be surprised if we got basically like a new multiversal map basically like how this map works what these
these worlds are, different things along those lines. It's a cool thing to see. Not only that, Jeff Johns looks like he's teasing future crises, like future events, right? Like he says, like it's, it's interesting, in the year 2020, Superman's timeline is bombarded by the reckless energies of the old gods, once again, warping the multi or the metaverse. Now, I don't know, I, I assume he's referring to Dark Side War when he says this, like I assume that's what he's referencing there. I could be wrong. Like my thought is if we're talking about the year 2020, then that's next year. Then we're talking about like what's going on in Justice League right now, like with Perpetua, the, the anti-monitor, the monitor, the forger of worlds and so on and so forth. But then you get July 2nd, 2025, a crisis unlike any other the metaverse has ever seen will erupt, calling it the Time Masters. I thought he was referencing the old Time Masters comic from 1990. I don't think he is. Like I think he's saying like there's going to be a crisis, like a major crisis in five years, which is kind of a long time, like or six years rather. It's kind of a long time to do, and do another crisis. But like in its wake, Superman is revitalized. It's this constant thing, right? These constant set of events. And it goes on and on and on and on. What he basically says is that no matter what the alternate reality is, no matter what universe it's in, no matter what time period uh, Superman arrives in that universe, that universe revolves around Superman. That there might be superheroes before him, but Superman ushers in a whole new era that had never been seen before his arrival, right? Before he stepped onto the scene. He's the most significant and the most important hero. And so as a result of that, what ends up happening is Manhattan basically starts snatching people away, right? He snatches away Adrian Veidt. He snatches away Mime and Marionette. He snatches away the comedian. Oh, he's, he, he takes away like, like Reggie, like brings up all to his location. And it's kind of a crazy thing there because what you end up having is basically him talking with Adrian Veidt. And Adrian Veidt's response is, you didn't care enough to save our world, right? There was no way to get you back to save our world. You thought our world was beyond hope and, and you felt like civilization on our world was beyond hope. What you needed was to be inspired. You needed somebody who could strike you in such a way to where it would totally shift your perception. That's what had to happen here is Manhattan had to kind of be yanked away from his disconnect from humanity and reconnect his humanity again. And in Adrian Veidt's mind, the only way to do that was to take him to a place where superpowered beings, despite all the various powers that they had, were still human, right? They still were still capable of fantastic things and they in and of themselves were inspiring. And so if he wanted to inspire Manhattan, then take him to a world of people who could inspire him, most notably Superman. And so with Manhattan seeing everything that goes on, knowing Manhattan would do his thing, knowing Manhattan would mess with things, he'd be curious and, and so on and so forth. The idea was to engineer a set of circumstances where ultimately Manhattan would end up in this particular universe and become inspired by Superman and then be inspired to save the world. And then by doing that, by getting Manhattan to reconnect with himself, the idea was then to somehow bring Manhattan back to the Watchmen universe and get Manhattan to fix the Watchmen universe. It was all the grand scheme of Adrian Veidt to save his own world. Now, of course, at that point, Comedian like shoots him in the stomach <laughs> or shoots him in the chest. And he's just like, you're out of luck, man. Like your time's done. Like that's it. And then Lex Luthor comes out of nowhere and basically just like ends up uh, ends up screwing up the, the temporal energies of, of Comedian and basically sends him back to where he came from, right? So it's Jeff John's way of saying, okay, Comedian, your time is done here. Back to the watching universe where you got thrown out of the building by Adrian Veidt and, uh, and then now you're going back to being dead again, right? And so basically he kind of gets sent right back to the moment in which he died where he was snatched away by Manhattan and brought into the DC universe. But it's sort of nuts because like from there, you you literally have these these scenarios where you really had Manhattan talking with Mime and Marionette and really sort of explaining this whole situation to them. When the question was like, you gotta, you know, when they say, you have to send us back to our universe because we need our son, rather, he starts telling them about how, like, no, you have a daughter that's basically on the way right now. As for your son, my plan is that you'll see each other again. You know, he'll he'll need an anchor here in this universe. So basically, Mime and Marionette are being left behind in the DC universe. They're staying here and they're not going back to the Watchmen universe. Now, this is important, right? Because we've seen Jeff Johns do this before specifically with Blackest Night and Brightest Day. That was the whole idea behind those two stories. Blackest Night was, was basically designed to bring back every single superhero and every single supervillain who ever died, right? To bring them all back. And then Brightest Day was designed to keep particular individuals, right? Not all of them, but to keep particular individuals. And then in turn, allow them to stay as part of the DC landscape. Everybody else just wasn't popular enough to keep around, so they all end up going back to being dead again. And so as a result of that, it's kind of a cool thing because what he does is kind of begin the, the process of sort of reconnecting, looking, looking at the world world as it exists now with the return of the Justice Society of America having been inspired by Superman and it's like a whole new day right because then from that point he jumps back to the Watchmen reality right ends up jumping back to the Watchmen dimension and when he does he basically begins a process of restoring things back after that like it's going from location to location right just sort of why you know we, we get this kind of explanation of the world as it unfolds right the world as it exists now Reggie you know Rorschach looks like he's staying in the DC universe and by remaining in this DC universe he's now a character that can be used at some point along the line how that will fare, I have no idea, but I imagine him probably getting a solo book, you know, but in turn, what also ends up happening is that with the, the child that's being born by Mime and Marionette, of course, 
Manhattan really kind of makes reference to this idea that he's not really able to understand or doesn't really seem to be able to grasp the details of what's going on with the son of Mime and Marionette, only for us to find out the reason why he can't do that is because the, the blind spot with the child is because of him, right? The blind spot with the child's future, the fact that he can't see that child's future is a result of Manhattan himself. And the reason for this is because Manhattan took the son of Mime and Marionette, right? He took this child away and then in turn went forward into the world, took the child to Mars, you know, and kind of looked at, at how these things unfolded and basically grabbed the child and said, okay, this kid now is going to essentially receive all of my powers. And that's exactly what he does. You know, he basically kind of disperses himself out there and then puts his powers within this child, right? So Manhattan, as he traditionally exists, is no longer in existence now, right? So it's like what you guys saw at the end of the Watchmen TV show, which I surmise is the reason why it took so long for this comic to come out so that we could kind of, the, the ending could coincide with the show and people could basically identify with the two concepts and understand what's going on. But with this child basically receiving the powers of Dr. Manhattan, what this does is it basically transitions to the home of Dan Dryberg and and Lori, right? I mean, we you guys know who they are, right? Like you guys know what's you know Silk Spectre and and uh, and and Night Owl. Of course, they're much older now. You know the world having been, the, the Watchmen world having basically been saved by Doctor Manhattan. Uh, you know their daughter basically shows up, and it's just kind of like okay, cool, right? Because this is the daughter of of um, Mima Marionette. This is basically being raised by Dan Dryberg and Lori Jaspezik. And so because of that, like the kid shows up on the front door, and it's just like you know she says, hey, my name's Sally. You know what's yours? And you know he's like, well, my name is Clark. John brought me here and said that like your parents would know what to do. It's a beautiful ending because basically you have kind of a Dr. Manhattan reborn uh, with all these various powers, but with no real ties, or I guess aside from the powers, no real ties to the history of the original Dr. Manhattan, but with like an insane amount of abilities. It's interesting and it's actually really, really cool. I'm pretty excited about it. What this does is it leaves these characters kind of open, right? Adrian Veidt didn't die. Adrian Veidt was basically put in prison, meaning Adrian Veidt is now in the DC universe. Uh, Rorschach is now in the DC universe. All these characters aside from the comedian are now in the DC universe. The only exception here is the son of Mima Marionette calling himself Clark and possessing the powers of Dr. Manhattan. Now, something else to point out here, and this is entirely possible, it could be that Manhattan brought these folks here from the Watchmen universe, right? But again, it seems as though this is all taking place in the Watchmen universe, you know, with regards to the daughter of Mima Marionette, Sally, uh, that's basically being raised by Lori Jaspezik and Dan Dryberg. It's cool. Like, it's, it's really, really amazing. I think it's a fitting end of the story. Was I expecting, like, this great big, huge knockdown drag out fight between Superman and Dr. Manhattan? Yeah, but, like, what chance will Superman really have, though, against that kind of power. So it kind of makes sense that we wouldn't really see it. And I think it speaks more to the nature of Superman that he was inspiring for Manhattan than anything else. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Core. If you guys want to see my uncensored versus videos, we're all, we're doing a whole bunch of like versus Dr. Manhattan versus videos right now. Uh, if you guys are interested in seeing that, head over to patreon.com slash comics explained. Uh, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace. We've got some new patrons in our top tiers over on patreon.com slash comics explain. I want to give a shout out to Jason C, Austin S, Jason S, Austin H, Philip, and Austin B, as well as Steven Z, Eagle F, Joey M, and Jeff R, as well as Genosis916. As always, we just usually keep the last name to an initial. It helps you guys to maintain your anonymity. Some of you guys have expressed concern about having like your first and last name thrown out there for the world to see. I do not blame you. For you guys who have joined up as part of our Patreon team, tiers that are eligible for Rob Core Honor Guard rings. Those whose rings have been sent out, you should already have them. If you're a new person who just joined up and you've been part of this tier for a month, your ring will be mailed out to you. So I want to say thank you guys for being patrons.